Hello, this is Chet Czar here, and welcome to another episode of the Dark Art Society podcast. It is episode 155. I had a really excellent interview with my old friend Steve Wang, who's a legend in the makeup effects world. Uh, he he made he made the Predator, so I mean that's pretty big time, and he's worked on everything. And uh, super great person, just a good person, and uh, uh, I really appreciate him coming on, spending some time. I had a really fun conversation talking about the old days and makeup effects, and uh, catching up with him and and uh, listening to all his crazy stories. Really excellent episode. Really, really good one. I'm excited to to share this one with you this week. Um. Yeah, how about that coronavirus? Crazy stuff, right? Well, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just like rolling with it. I'm not worried. I don't feel afraid. I mean, I'm being careful and I'm, you know, washing my hands and I'm not going out, but I'm not feeling afraid about it. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm just rolling with it. I think I, I, you know, I'm, I'm an optimistic person, but I kind of see this as, you know, one positive aspect maybe is that, you know, maybe this is an opportunity for us to rise to the occasion and just kind of be there for each other during this, you know? Um, I don't know. I just don't think people should be panicking. Uh, I think the panic is worse than the virus. So, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm staying indoors, but I always stay indoors. This is what I do. So it's, uh, I, I, it's not much, honestly, not much difference for me in my life and my day to day. But, um, yeah, so I'm just going to keep doing this podcast because people are going to need things to listen to if they're stuck at home and not working. And uh, so, yeah, we're just going to keep going. Just keep going. That's what I always do. I keep going. We should all just keep going and, uh, you know, be there for each other. Be there for each other. I feel like specifically in this little dark art community we've built i think that if any one of us was in trouble we'd all kind of rally around and pitch in and try and help out so you know and don't be afraid to reach out if you're feeling bad you know use use social media for something good instead of what it's normally used for these days reach out connect with people you care about it's not the end of the world Things might get crazy, but it's not the end of the world. Anyway, let's get on with it. My crazy art life. Let's see what's been going on. I've been doing the tool poster doodles that I pre-sold about six weeks ago. And those are looking really cool. And you could, if you want to see them, I'm posting them on my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash chetzar. I'm doing time lapses of each one. So every person that bought... A tool poster through me gets it doodled and gets it the time lapse of the doodle. You'll get a link to that as well through through the Patreon. So you'll be able to have like a provenance. And they're coming out really cool. I'm I'm totally getting into it. Um for the most part I'm not just doing, you know, doodles of little monster faces on them. I'm kind of changing the whole overall poster and Anyway, I'm having fun with it. I'm almost at this point. I'm almost halfway through. I'm going to work on some more tonight. I should get to the halfway point and finish the rest over the next couple days. Start shipping by the end of the week. And um, if you hear this today, which is Tuesday, I'm recording it. I'm going to start selling the the uh, third poster I did for Tool, which was called Melt, a painting called Melt, and. Um, that's going to go on sale on Wednesday for Patreon members. $50 people and up get first dibs and get 20% off. And then Thursday, this Thursday, the 
19th. They'll go to the lower tiers, and then this Friday, the 20th, I will release them to the public for anybody who wants to buy one. Uh, so that's been it. It's been all about the, you know, the coronavirus craziness and um, doodling posters and staying at home and hanging out and working like I always do. So, okay, uh, that's that's about it. So I'm not going to dwell on that too much. Uh, let's do subscri- the new subscribers. We've got four new subscribers this week. Okay, Chrissy Whiskey, who's a, a great artist in the community. Thank you, Chrissy. Check her stuff out. Um, Tom Taggart, who's been on the podcast. He's another great artist. His Patreon's doing really well. He, his, uh, he does these, one of the many things he does in his sculpture career is these bookshelf monsters and he got his 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 stuff recently went viral so i I heard he's doing pretty well with new uh, patreon supporters his his name's out there and that's really cool so congrats tom and thank you for supporting i think you were supporting before but maybe your something happened and you had to re-support but thank you or maybe you weren't maybe you were just supporting my personal one either way thank you Okay, Megan Nevada, thank you for supporting. Oh, that fourth one was a deletion, not a new subscriber. (laughs) Okay, so thank you all for supporting. Much appreciated. You're keeping the podcast going, and we need podcasts like these, especially now during these trying times. Okay, uh, I want to read an email real quick before we start. I got this great email from somebody oh i forgot before i get into this email we're still trying to get i liked chet czar i like to paint monsters the documentary that mike carell made about me and my artwork and more importantly about the dark art movement we're trying to get it on netflix so i forgot to mention that i've been forgetting to mention it um during the episodes but uh if you can you can go and recommend that on the netflix website there should be a link in the description here uh, on the on SoundCloud and on I think it transfers over to the other feeds it goes into. But if you could go and recommend Chet Czar, I like to paint monsters to Netflix, that would be really cool because we want to get this movie out for the so everyone could see it. Basically, okay, I did that. Let me. I'm looking at my list here. All right, email this email. Okay, a fellow, a supporter, a dark art society member named R. E. Chappelle. I believe his name is. He sent me a really cool message um, on Patreon, and I thought it would be—I thought it was worth a read. So, okay, here's what he said: "Chet, I love your podcast, and I've been a fan of your work for years. I'm a painter in New Orleans, and I do generally dark, surrealistic stuff. So I've really been enjoying listening to you and Mike Carell talk about the dark art movement." He must, have, he must be listening to old episodes because Mike's not on the show anymore, but all good. I've also really enjoyed interviews you've had with people in the makeup effects industry. In one of your podcasts, you asked for feedback, so here are a couple paragraphs on dark art as a tool for emotional transformation and fortification. If you're busy, don't feel pressured to reply to this. I did reply because I asked, asked him uh, if I could read it on the air and uh, thanked him for his cool letter. Okay. When you were talking about the benefits we get from dark art, you mentioned catharsis. Another thing I found dark art can offer for people who develop an appreciation for it is it can function as a desensitization training tool. Experiencing dark art, whether paintings, music, film, or literature, can be used to train the brain to respond to painful or threatening stimuli with a reduced stress response, while simultaneously psychologically building a sense of mastery over the depicted trials and tribulations. With repetition, this type of transformation of enhancing one's coping abilities functions very much along the same lines as exposure therapy a type of therapy found to be successful in treating trauma and anxiety-based disorders. When exposure therapy is 
used successfully, patients are able to desensitize emotional targets through repeated controlled exposure. This is why horror is thrilling and cathartic when it is done well. It actually propels its when it's when it's done. Sorry, when it is done well, it actually propels its audience towards some towards emotional growth and development. Here's a TED talk about how horror movies help their audience refine their coping skills in a safe, controlled manner, and I will put this link in the description. Um, he said in, qu- in quotations. Also, search YouTube for TED. TED Talk Horror Movies for six other videos on the subject. It's also important to note that the feelings of catharsis we're talking about tend to be contingent upon the viewer's enjoyment of the media. This is why so many people in the past have thrown accusations of moral depravity at artists who make dark art and horror. The people who do not enjoy it are not experiencing the elevation others get from it. They experience it as a reflection of the lurking dangers in our world. So sometimes we just have to be patient with them. Keep up the great podcast. R.E. Chappell. Chappell. I hope I'm pronouncing it right because it's such a great letter. Thank you for writing that. That's really uh, excellent and interesting and something I've always thought, you know, the the idea that um, we're able to turn things that scare us into art and confront them in a safe way. You know, if you've been following me, you know I've been saying this for forever. So uh, it's, you know, one of the many benefits of it. Uh, the TED Talk is really pretty good. What is the guy's name? I should have written this down. Um, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. It's a guy who studies horror. M- Matthias Clausen. M A T H I A S, the last name C L A S E N, and uh, he, I believe, he studies horror and analyzes it, and um, like he's a fan, but he's also a brainiac, you know, researcher, scientific researcher. So it's really cool that people are studying this, which is something I've called for as well many times. So. Anyway, I thought um, I was going to read this anyway, but with the uh, coronavirus scare, I think it's even more appropriate. You know, it's like horror horror films help you deal with scary shit, basically, (laughs) in a safe way. But I like this. I like this um, this idea that it this exposure therapy idea. So interesting. Uh, Anyway, I thought that was cool. And, you know, if you have any comments about this, you know, you could write me an an email or a message on Patreon or in the Dark Art Society group page or whatever. And uh, maybe I'll read it on here, too. But I thought I'd like I just wanted to share that with you. I thought it was pretty cool. So thank you, R.E. Chappell. Much appreciated. Okay, enough of my blathering. Let's get on with this excellent interview with my good buddy, the amazing, the brilliant Steve Way. What's up, Steve? Hey, what's up, Chet? It's been so long. It um, has, right? <laughs> I, I only see you maybe at Monster Palooza yep. on occasion, and then uh, sometime the Copro. Right. And uh, yeah, it's been crazy. I know. Like, I, it's been forever. It's been forever. I'm uh, God. We've worked together. I don't. Do you remember the first time we worked together? Um, I, I think it was Planet of the Apes, wasn't it? Was that the Ricks? first time? I I've met you before then. I think. Yeah. Well, yeah. you were in the you were in the Scream at George Halloween contest. That's right. Yeah, you won yeah. that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Way back when. <laughs> I remember yeah. that. We we're all babies back then. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I see that. There's that vid- that videos on YouTube. That screaming. Ad- <laughs> Have you seen that lately? Yes, yes. The video of shame. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh god, it's so embarrassing. It's so it's embarrassing. So, so cringeworthy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll have to put a link to that in the, in the description of the podcast because it's, but that thing you the the 
the creature you made was amazing. It was amazing. Oh, I remember, you. like, I remember I was so bummed because I thought, oh, mine's gonna win, it's, and and then I and then you won, and I was like, he deserved to win. His was the best. It was well, it was so thank cool. You. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah we, he's, we tease Brian Wade all the time because you know <laughs> he got up there and he was doing this dance, and we oh, called yeah. it the Wade. <laughs> <laughs> and then That's the worst right. thing, I forgot the worst about thing was they, they couldn't use the actual music he was dancing to. So they put this kind of space music from the 50s. It sounds like it was from Forbidden Planet. Right. So it completely has no, even has no rhythm to it. So he's there like dancing his heart out and it's completely off looking. <laughs> It's so funny. I forgot all about that. Yeah, when we're working with Brian, we always give him shit about it. <laughs> lucky he, uh, lucky he, um, he had that mask on at least <laughs> to cover his face. <laughs> Well, you know him and uh, him and uh, him and uh, uh, Mike Smithson. They get I, they get they get a lot of shit back in the day for the for the uh, the uh, hair extensions. <laughs> Do oh, you remember yeah, the hair yeah. extensions? Oh yeah, I remember. I remember the the Lost Boys. Yeah, <laughs> one party I went to, and it was like it was Brian, and it was like um, I think it was Keith Edmire, maybe. Mm-hmm. But uh, oh, shit, there was all the all the the Canem group, mm-hmm. right? And they all had their long extensions and the eyebrow piece and the lenses and the fangs. <laughs> and I remember walking by going, oh, look at those glampires. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was those were the days, yeah. man. Those were the days. It's so funny going through all those old pictures. And, so uh, funny. You uh, can't help but just laugh at everything we did back oh, then. Oh, I know, right? It was, it was a fun time. Yeah, it was amazing. <clears throat> if you think about, um, God, I mean, the early the – early, I always – felt like the effects business kind of got worse i got in and it seemed like it was on the blob mm-hmm. remake and, and it just seemed to slowly kind of it was the best show i ever worked on and it kind of slowly went downhill from there <laughs> over like 30 years or whatever or 25 years or whatever oh we had fun on the cave right oh god yeah that, i mean that was <laughs> there, there was some hilarious and fun moments but that was actually the show that I was like, okay, I'm qu- I'm getting out of the business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's good to know. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> no, it was, it was, it was the, you know, it was, it was a, a, a lot of different things coming together at once. It was uh, just the small, everyone working in that small area and having to pull, and it was so hot outside and yeah. having to pull all the painting stuff outside oh, under yeah. that tent okay. and then having to drag it back in at, at night. And then the, the creature was amazing. It looked so good. The creature you you had, you know, it was your creature. Well, no, it was, yeah, it was it was all of our creature. I mean, you did a huge amount of work on that. Oh yeah, well, you. I mean, it, I don't know. It was I appreciate it, but it, it was it was amazing. The creature was amazing, and then it's like the movie ended up just being like, like where's the creature? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it wasn't a great movie, and I was just like, come on. It's always, yeah, it's always like that. It's like every time I work on a film, nine times out of ten, it's a huge heartbreak. You know, yeah, I know, I know. That's it's not replaced by CG. They they always say, "Oh, less is more," and I'm just like, you know, sometimes less is just less. Like you just don't mm-hmm. even see. We said five months, we built this army of creatures, and people don't even know what the hell a creature looks like at the I end know, of the film. I know, I know. It's just it's just shame, it, it, one after another. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it, it's it's you know, it kills you. It kills you a little bit inside every time that happens. But yeah, I mean, you were you actually you were a really cool. You're a great boss. You're great to work. I was. I really enjoy working with you, and I and you know someone you respect as well. It's a great artist, and and you know you were cool, and you didn't flip out or anything. You're just like a great person to work for. Oh, thank you. But it you. was like, it was just the circumstances. I think of that shop and the build and everything, and yeah. it was just it was it was insane. But um, Tim Tim Gore was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time he was like. He he, I don't know. He he was mustering mustering up the courage to tell me to not to play Britney Spears or something. <laughs> out there. He was so scared, and I think he got like a bunch of people together. Like, hey, if I go up there, will you guys back me up? <laughs> yeah, that was... And I was just like, no, I'm gonna play Britney Spears louder. <laughs> That was funny. I always thought that was like I had so much as much as I, I never liked Britney Spears. I had so much respect for you because you were like, fuck you guys. I like Britney Spears. I'm going to blast Britney Spears. I was like, that's kind of punk rock, actually, to do that. Well, that's the funny thing. You know, I was totally into punk rock way back in the 80s, right. early 80s. Yep. And, you know, and the one thing that I really subscribed to was the notion of 
that if you're a punk, you do whatever the hell you want. Exactly. You know, whatever whatever resonates with you is what you do. But then I think uh, like by 83, I got t- completely out of the punk scene because I went to a punk show and I saw this group of six uh, kids with mohawk and flannel around their waist yep. yelling at six kids that were dressed like new wave. And basically what they're saying was like, you're a fucking poser. And right. the other guys are like, you're a fucking I... poser. <laughs> and I'm going, well, you six look exactly the same. Then you six look exactly the same. And I'm just like, I'm fucking out of here, man. This is bullshit. That's what, you know, all, all the old punks that you hear about from that era all kind of say the same thing by around yeah. that time that it became like you had to have a uniform you had to look a certain way but prior yeah. to that it was like the place where all the all the misfits went to you know yeah. all the people that couldn't fit anywhere else went to the punk shows because it mm-hmm. was like a free-for-all and it, the whole point was come up with your own sound with your music <laughs> come up with your own style and 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 so you've got all these a lot of the older punks, like I, I'm a big fan of the Minuteman and Mike Watt and stuff, and and they're all they never sounded punk at all, but they were kind of like this in this punk scene, and they were like, you know, Mike Watt was like it was the whole punk thing to us was to do exactly what you said, to do what you want, and to try and come yeah. up with your own unique sound. That was it. Because in the early days, I remember going there, and I would go there with a fucking bright blue MTV T-shirt and a pair of jeans, and nobody gave me shit. Ever. Right. Yeah, and I respected that. I thought yep. this was cool, you know, because yeah, right. I thought for sure they would be like, ah, you're fucking MTV. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't give a shit. I wasn't really into MTV. I just wore it to see what people would say, and, and they were cool. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's 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 a shame, but I guess that's the way everything goes once once something becomes popular, maybe, yeah, and people stop getting it. Um, yeah, you've had such a, an amazing career, and... Uh, it's not only amazing because, of course, you you worked on Predator and all these, you know, tons of movies from the old days. You were in there during the heyday of the uh, uh, effects business. But also the way you have, I I think what's really interesting is the way you have um, what you've done with your career now and kind of adapted to this new world we live in. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, some some of these you're doing like I mean I'm not sure exactly what you're doing right now, but I mean in the in the fairly recent past you've been doing these incredible like fine art sculptures for Blizzard Entertainment I believe right, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they're just amazing, amazing, amazing like well, mind blowing sculptures. And are you still doing that kind of stuff? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we're still doing that. That is the coolest niche you could ever get into it it's is amazing. you know it, it's it i fell into it accidentally and it was oh, it really was, yeah it, it's one of those things where i feel like you know there was a lot of synchronicity involved because right. i think back in 2004 i got a call from a guy named nick carpenter from blizzard and he mm-hmm. was one of the head guys there and um and he basically you know asked me hey you know i'm, I'm a fan of your work and i want to know if you want to do a statue of one of our characters you know and i was like yeah sure you know whatever i'm, I'm curious to see what it is <laughs> And it was this really super hot, like, uh, space army, like, uh, girl named Nova for a game that actually ended up not coming out. Mm. But she's part of this universe that still exists, and she's she's a real character in this universe Mm. in other games. Um, And so the money they had was so little, I knew that if I took this job, I would have to actually work the second part of this project, like, a month for free, basically. Because there was just barely enough to cover materials and a little bit of labor. Right. Um, but, and then at that time I was offered by Mike Elizaldi at Spectral to do, to go work on, uh, Fantastic Four, which I think you worked on. Yeah. 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 He offered me the job on that. And then I was offered to head up, uh, for Patrick, the topless, uh, was it the resident, not resident evil, the, uh, Silent Hill. Mm. So I had those two that I knew were going to be good paying jobs, but instead I turned them both down because I wanted to do, I wanted to be challenged and I wanted to do something that was more natural looking and more realistic. And, and that would be seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did. at that point I wasn't quite sure, you know, I, I didn't really know much about Blizzard or the game companies and right. stuff like that. And so I took that job and I, and I had so much fun. And it, it was one of those jobs where when it was when it was finally finished and I took it up to go set up at E3, I felt like, wow, I wanted to keep working on her. <laughs> really? You know, yeah, I had so much fun. I want to just keep going. <laughs> but of course, the job was done. Yeah. And then next thing I know like 15 16 years later i'm still making statues for blizzard it's so you know? amazing yeah, how many, how many have you done so far gosh i can't even remember it's it's <laughs> it's got to be like uh i don't know 15, 12 to 15 maybe jeez and they're huge too and they're yeah, got the lights lights. in them and they got you know they're just yeah and they're intense because yeah the, the cool thing about working for a company like blizzard you know for riot games whatever is that 
you're not working with uh, producers that only care about money or right. something. You're, you're working with artists. You know, oh, so cool. Nick Nick is a hardcore like you know he's a cinematic director over there, and he's also one of the original designers of the characters and stuff. And so, like working with somebody like him who really loves what he does and is so intense into the details of it, you know, literally like you know you you have to up your game constantly, you know, and 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 like how how often do we get challenged to do that in the films, right? It's always right. just bang it out fast as you can because yep. there's no money to support it. Yeah. And so this was uh, this was a, a really fun part of it. And then and then when you're working with you know uh, uh, designs and stuff, a lot of times they'll give you a design, but then they'll also ask me, hey, can you like embellish this a little bit? Or oh, cool. with Riot Games, you know, each statue we do, they didn't just give us like a 3D model or whatever. It's like we work with their artists, we come up with a pose or something with them. Right. You know, then we'll sculpt a maquette. You know, and then and then basically from there we sculpt it all out of clay and we work with them and then any kind of feedback we get are from artists so yeah. it's very it's very constructive there's never any egos involved which is great yeah you know? it's amazing it yeah. sounds like the, a dream job kind of it, yeah it is it, it's you know every time we do a statue i totally look forward to doing it because it's that's amazing it really is like a different world it's yeah. not like the movie world yeah and and it doesn't have to move <laughs> yes. the other thing that's, is kind of yes. cool they, you know it's funny because <laughs> when i was when i first wanted to get into the business i really didn't want to do makeup or anything like that i did really? a little bit of that on my own but I just wanted to make masks, you know, because I want something people can go up to and look at and study it up close and, you know. And then I kind of lost my taste for masks over the years because, you know, they, the latex, they rot. Right. And, they, they, and then over time, like, it break, when these things go away, they break your heart because, like, oh, man, this thing, I love right. this thing from way back. So then I got into sculpting these statues and, and my collectibles, which is now resin. And you know that if you don't break it, it'll last forever. Right. And so, and then, um, and then the statue sort of correlates with the idea of, you know, being able to see it in person and more like a museum kind of thing, which I really love that, that whole presentation yeah, right? aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's great too, because it's finally, it's putting, um, makeup effects technology and makeup effects talent, which I think is make the talent, you know, the talent in the makeup effects world is so immense it's huge yeah. like it's yeah. it's really it's kind of crazy like the best people in effects are amazing really amazing <laughs> artists so it's like it's yeah. taking the technology and the and the um the talent of the effects industry and it's really creating a piece of fine art out of it and um which is you know kind of the whole thing with the conjoin uh, the idea with the co conjoin show is like yeah. you know really the difference between fine art and um commercial art for movies as in effects the the real difference is uh, the context of how it's shown is really the only mm -hmm. difference. So, yeah. so so being able to show these as just these amazing you know like traditional sculptures, but but it's 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 showcasing how much talent is in effect. Yeah, basically. it's also a different point of view in the sense that you know you you have to have to be sort of the best of both worlds because in effects we're tasked with trying to recreate life. Right. You know something has to look realistic and believable. And then when you get into creatures, you have to also take that into consideration. Like, what would this creature look like if it really existed? Mm -hmm. So the best of the best, we approach it like it's a real living thing. And a lot of thought and care goes into everything from texture to color to form, functionality, you know, right. all that kind of stuff that I think of when I'm making creatures. Oh, yeah. And then so then you couple that with, you know, this more of a demand now this last few decades of artists being – able to to understand and, and be proficient at human anatomy animal mm. anatomy like all the anatomy sculptures now is it's a it's a very sort of a strong requirement for our business right so you're so people who can do classic kind of art but not the finish now we can do the finish as well so you kind right. of put the two and two together and then mix that with mixed media essentially that's kind of what we do now with our statues yeah 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 are you what are you um just technic just technically I'm curious what are you casting everything out of for these Oh, we do. We cast stuff out of uh, silicone. Uh, we make resin eyes. You know, we use a lot of epoxy resins if it needs to be strong and light. Mm -hmm. Anything that doesn't need to be strong and light, uh, or doesn't, doesn't need to be light, we'll just use like regular fiberglass. Mm. Um, you know, and then all the, the a lot of the costume element are all real real cloth. Oh, okay. You know, some some stuff will sculpt like boots. will still sculpt because we can sculpt them pretty real, realistic. Oh, that's interesting. And, and then paint them to look. Mm -hmm. Yeah, instead of trying to make real boots because it actually the fiberglass version will actually last longer yeah that's a good point <laughs> yeah. yeah so yeah so it, it just depends you know and, and the one thing over the years we've developed too is that we we've we've developed a, a new a different way of engineering all these things too that's what i was gonna say is i bet you have this down to a science at this point 
Yeah, yeah, we do. And and it's, you know, like when you make something for movies, it just has to work on set. Right. So a lot of times, you know, like you, you'll you make something, you, it just works just fine. And then it's really, yo, cut, it breaks, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that, this is not an option for us here. Right. Everything we make has to be super strong and, and last for years. Archival, yeah. Yeah, and so we so we have different ways of like assembling. You know, we, we got we got down to the science where we make everything that will keep together. Everything that you know, we, we don't require many tools to put one of these things together. Like oh, in wow. a lot of our, a lot of our most complex statues require one tool, and most of it's all hand cranked stuff. You know, that's oh, so cool. Yeah, and magnets and all this kind of shit. So that's so amazing. that it's, it's as easy to put together as possible. That's so cool. That's another fun uh, fun element to it. I imagine if you have the the, the, the money for it to spend time mm-hmm. to figure out how to make it fit together nice and clean and neat. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, and credit you know, for that goes to my, my partner, Cleve, you know, he's, he's been with me since 2011 and he was originally the, the, the mole shop supervisor at Jim Henson's creature shop. Here Who is that? Thunderman. Oh, okay. I, I, yeah. Do I know him? I don't know if I've met him before. Yeah. Oh, I know him. Wait a minute. Paul guy. Like reddish blonde hair. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think I, where did I, I don't know. I worked with him at. Is, is he like real kind of happy upbeat? Yeah, guy? always. Yeah, always. yeah. He yeah. laughs like he laughs like Mozart on um, uh, the Amadeus. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him I said hi. Yeah, I worked with him. I can't remember what I worked with him on. Yeah. But, um, oh, that's cool. Well, I didn't know he was your partner. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's just like he's been with me for so many years, and you know, essentially, when we do all these projects. He and I engineer it all together. <laughs> So, you know, yeah, we're kind of like the backbone of the, the, the operation, you know. So yeah. are, are you are you doing any effects work anymore or is it something yeah, you would actually, do? Or? I, I got out of it for a while. Like, I really didn't. Yeah, I was so like sick, you, it, you mm-hmm. know, because it was just constant heartbreak. You know, I think the, the one <laughs> the one that kind of broke the camel's back for me was when I did Batman versus Superman. Uh-huh. You know, uh, Patrick Totopoulos, who I was our director for for many years, uh, he was the production designer on the film. He called me up and said, hey, you know, we're doing this back creature. Uh, talk to the director. Zach wants to do it, you know, practically. And so and, and so does he. So we, we got together. He gave me some sketches, and we kind of worked it out. We built this creature. Uh, Patrick was really happy with it. Zach loved it. But the whole time, we had the visual effects side of it just opposed to anything that was was done traditionally. Really? And so, yeah. And then so he was always making comments, you know. This is what I'm here. what I heard anyway. It was like coming right. comments like, why are you bothering doing this way? We're going to replace it with CG anyway and all that kind of stuff. And so we did it anyway. Brought it on set. We shot it. Tom Flouts came flew out with me. And, you know, he he, is, he and I applied the makeup together. And then um, it turned out, I thought it turned out really cool. Everybody was really happy. We shot it, you know. Um, um, What's his name? Um, ben Affleck really liked it. He was kind of creeped out by it. Oh, cool. Uh, Richard <laughs> Citrone, was, uh, he played the creature, and he's amazing. He also was the stunt Batman you know, cool. in the movie. Mm-hmm. And um, so when it was all done and finished, and the film comes out like two and a half years later, uh, it happened. It was so fast that literally if you blink, you miss it. It's like it's on screen for literally 12 frames or something ridiculous. <laughs> how, and how long did like, you spend building that thing? We, well, we, we had about six weeks. So it was kind of a, a tight one. But, right. you know, uh, but still, still it was just, yeah, it was just like, you know, um, it came out so fast. I thought, OK, well, at least it looked kind of cool, but it was really fast. And then when the film came out on Blu-ray, I was able to to frame by frame it. And then at that point, I just I was like, I quit this business. Really? <laughs> because when I frame by framed it in the close up of the face, they did some kind of weird CG thing. Like, oh no! Yeah, like it was all like you know how you take two D like uh, like um, what's that the the Photoshop one where you go in and you kind of like uh, morph things and like gooey around stuff. Oh yeah, the liquify tool. Liquify. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody went there and like liquify crap all over his face. Oh my god! And so because, they won't even give you your twelve frames. No, it was so fast you couldn't even tell. And then and unless you freeze frame it, you could then you can tell what they did. What a dick! <laughs> right, but then in the making of the making of book, they had the picture of the actual creature in the scene without any effect on it, ah. and it looks really cool. And then in the and I just thought, you know what? This is bullshit because this is we can't win right. because whoever is the last man standing in a production, which is usually usually post production, yep. will have the say and do whatever they, the hell they want, yep. you know. And so you can't win. Yeah. And I, at that point, I was like, I'm done. I'm out of this fucking business. I'm just gonna keep doing the statues and my collectibles and whatever. So this went on for quite a few years, and then uh, we still end up doing a couple films here and there. Like you know, when when we were Alliance Studio, we did uh, Inrong the the. Um, the Wolf Brigade, the Korean film, mm. uh, and then we did uh, Alien Outpost or something. It was a friend of, you know, 
the, the, the director was a friend. But so aside from that, I was just like, when the film comes in, like, I don't even want to bid on it. I don't care. Um, wow. So it wasn't until last year when we formed uh, uh, Onyx Forge Studio, which is my, now my new company, mm. um, that I decided, you know what, let's try getting back into films again. Um, and so we're lucky enough, we got, uh, um, I got called by Kevin Yeager, who was working on on uh, Bill and Ted Face to Music. Oh, and, cool. and yeah, so he and Bill Corso, I guess, had talked, and Bill was the makeup effects, uh, makeup uh, the head on the film. So they had recommended me to come meet the director. To they needed a robot character who was like a, a comedy character you know, in the film, designed and built this thing. And so they said, yeah, can you come in and meet with the director? So I went and met with him, and I had a, I had kind of a little fanboy moment because. Uh, it, was, it was Dean Parrish, so he directed uh, Galaxy Quest, which is one of oh, my favorite films. Yeah, it's a great film. Yeah, yeah. So I had a Have you seen the documentary? A uh, little side note: Have you seen the documentary about Galaxy Quest? No, I didn't know there was. One. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's you'll love it. Yeah. I, okay, I, I'll, I'll look it up. I forgot what it's called, but it's great. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Well, cool, I'll look it up. Yeah. So yeah, so I, so I kind of nerded out a little bit, and then I, I sat and I talked to him a little bit about the 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 idea, the the film. And, you know, I just said, give me a week and I'll come back with a design. And then when I came back with this design, he loved it and hired me on the spot. And then wow. we had like six weeks to build it, which was super <laughs> stressful. Yeah. And I was like, ah, this is why I quit the film business. <laughs> um, yeah. But we did the best we could. You know, uh, the actor, um, this guy named Anthony Kerrigan, he's in that show Barry with uh, 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 Bill Hader. Mm. He was uh, he's, he's that, that bald guy. The um, I think uh, he's like the... The Russian the, mobster, the Russian mobster guy. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah, that fun, yeah, he's kind he of like the fan- funny, funny character. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He was fantastic to work with, That's and cool. he was really funny in the makeup. And um, so then we we you know we brought on said the, the director Dean. He loved it, you know, and and so yeah, so we had a good time on that one. That's great. And then uh, and then we just finished a film called Thunder Force uh, with a, it was a Netflix movie with Melissa McCarthy and Jason Bateman. Oh, cool. Yeah, and we we made something for Jason Bateman to wear for his character. It's like a superhero parody kind of comedy. Oh, cool. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know if I should say anything about Jason Bateman's character, but yeah, I don't, but other than just because I don't know, I, I don't think I'm supposed to say anything. Right, about, right. But, but basically, cool. when you see him in the film, you'll see what we do. Okay, well, that's awesome. Yeah. So you you're you're kind of, I guess, are you sort of just still doing both and uh... yeah we're just doing both i mean if it, you know like we're, we're we're actively trying to you know to to get our name back out again and, and say hey we're around doing stuff we've met a lot of people since you know and, and hopefully something will happen there's a couple of films that might be going on that we might be involved with we'll see yeah i'm, uh, sure, I'm sure it'll. So it's it's not the main focus you know because right now we're just we're just doing anything everything that we do so statues especially props my collectibles movies whatever comes you know that's what we'll do that's cool are you you're staying busy uh yeah i was we were really busy last year but this year has been a slow start hmm. i hear it's kind of slow everywhere right now yeah yeah <clears throat> Yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, from yeah, what I hear we, too. Yeah, we we've, we've you know we we've been hit with a lot of interest from game companies lately. Mm. So we're working on trying to get a few a few of those gigs, and then now we have this you know COVID nineteen right. coronavirus, and and it's kind of starting to get a little bit uh, out of hand. So I don't know what's going to happen with with you know. Yeah, I it, know these companies are going to pull the trigger, or they're going to wait. I know? know it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Um. How many how many people are in? Do you have like a a, a regular crew that you keep? Um, do you have like a main crew that you keep around? Or uh, yeah, I have like a core group of like one, two, three, four, five, about six or seven people. Wow, that's yeah. amazing, man! That's, that's so studio. cool. Yeah, and uh, you know, and they're just kind of in and out. They'll 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 do part time if things are really slow. You know, oh, cool. they do do their own personal projects, and so we keep it. You know, we keep things going, <clears throat> um, and then. When things pick up, we we can fit as much as maybe twenty five people in the shop. Wow! Yeah, yeah. Right. We just built an upstairs section fabrication room, so cool, it's nice. Man. It's nice up there. We have a new paint room upstairs too with a spray booth. Wow! So yeah, it's very impressive, Steve. It's very impressive. Um, are you? St- how about directing? I mean, I you you yeah. have the most amazing sad directing story <laughs> the, you know the the drive story oh my yeah. god that is like i can't believe that is not that should be kind of like public knowledge it's such an incredible story it's such a bummer yeah i don't i'm not sure that that's all that unique though you know because I, I think I, hollywood is just designed to just fuck you up and break your heart <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and you know, and I, I really don't think my story is unique. You know, I, I've well, met other filmmakers, and they they get their ass well, handed to them constantly. Yeah, I know. I know. But the, what's unique about I think your story is basically, you know, the movie that that you made got you know someone. I don't. Was it ripped off, or was it just happened to be a similar type of movie that? Became, oh, like yeah. Was that, it? Um, What's the one with Jackie Chan and and, and uh, um, yeah, I know I can't think of the name of it. Yeah. <laughs> you, you blocked it out. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's only made a few hundred million dollars. You know? <laughs> it was, it and was... it's only Jackie and Chris Rock. Jackie Chan and Chris Rock. Yeah, it's funny. Incidentally, when it, at the very early incarnation of the film, Chris Tucker, uh, Jackie Chris Chan, Tucker, and Chris, Tucker. Chris Tucker. Yes, Chris right. Tucker. Uh, I actually considered Chris Tucker. I was like, Chris Tucker would be good for this role. And we reached out to his agency, and and he had just booked. Um, uh, Rush Hour. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah Rush Hour. <laughs> he, he had just booked this film, um, the the Luke Besson movie, the um, oh, okay. Space. Wow, I'm seriously like getting old, man. I can't remember. <laughs> we are I can't remember old, anything. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, that that space comedy one with uh, Mila Jovovich, you know, and and Bruce Willis. Ah, uh, I can't even think of what. I can't. I know, right? I've seen that movie like five million <laughs> times. I can't remember the name. What? Uh, <laughs> well, anyway, can you can you? So he, what's that? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, so no anyways, I was like, just gonna say, can, was that, yeah. can you tell that uh, a quick uh, version of that story? Oh, sure, because sure, it's yeah. it's like when I I saw the movie you made, and I was like, this is fucking great. I couldn't believe what happened. So anyway, if you could, you know, this yeah. is a long time ago too, and it was yeah, like, yeah, it was uh, it's almost it's almost twenty no like eighteen years ago or something like that. Um, but anyway. Long story short, it's um I got this job to to make this movie. They gave me a script, and I was like, well, I don't know that I can make this movie at this budget. It's like a three million, three million dollar budget, you know. I, it, and it's like it's called Drive, and it's got all this driving battle action. I said we can't do this on a low budget film. Let's let me rewrite it with the action scenes as um, martial arts. And so we so I, I reworked it as a martial arts kind of film. We went out. <clears throat> and uh, we we before I shot it, I met with the the money the main money guy, who um, it, it, I'll just say he's very Hollywood as much as you would expect <laughs> from a Hollywood type. You know, essentially he'll he'll install you in your face and not bat an eye. So I I told him I said you know I think this movie it's got some fun fun comedy in it, but I feel like it needs to be there needs to be more comedy. It, it really lends itself to be an action comedy. Mm-hmm. And he, in front of the board meeting and in front of everybody, he just says, you know, well, I have no confidence in your ability to direct comedy. So, oh my God. Uh, so just make it a straight action movie. Ass. And so I remember leaving with the producer and, and, uh, and he's like, man, that was harsh. What are you going to do? I said, fuck him. I'm going to make comedy. <laughs> so, so from day one, yes. I literally just, I'm, you know, I, I Kadeem Harrison was, was the one of the main actors and Mark Dacascos, you know, he was just in John Wick part three and so I, I sat with these guys you know and and i just said hey look guys we're gonna make a comedy and kadeem he's like a brilliant comedy genius already on his own mm-hmm. uh, and mark's actually a really funny guy too you know he, he plays a good straight straight man to the comedy mm-hmm. so i just say what's just an ad lib let's the shit out of this movie let's whatever comes let's just fuck let's just fucking do it so we did it day one uh Dailies went out. Next day they came back. The, the the word I got from the producer was like, of all the films I have made in that company, these were the best dailies they've ever gotten. Wow. And day after day, it was it was weird. Like day after day, they would like line up to to go see the dailies because that was like the highlight of the day for wow. them. Yeah. yeah, and they were never disappointed. And so by the time I finished, I wrapped the film. I, I had uh, worked. It was like a five and a half week, no six six week shooting schedule. For five and a half weeks, I had worked twenty two hours a day. Oh my god! And and I'm not kidding. Like literally, yeah. I would sleep one hour a day uh, in my trailer, and I would stay up. Um, I'd do twelve hour shift, eat dinner. I do another like you know, uh, ten hour shift, and then I go home to an, an hour and I or two hours to shower, come back and continue shooting. So only lunchtime I get an hour to to sleep. Wow! And I did this for thirty five days straight. Oh my god! An hour a day. And I don't even know how I pulled it off. How old were you? I was thirty. Jeez. Yeah. And so, so I did. So I did all that, and then at one point we had gone over budget, and I was not told of this. Uh, the, oh, the producer, wow. Mike Leahy, you know, he was really a great guy. Just was just championing for me the whole mm. time. And but he didn't tell me we were going over budget, and because I guess he was trying to shield me from it. Mm. But ultimately, what happened was the Bond company came in and said, "Hey, you're going over budget, and you can't finish this film." And then so I found out the day that I had to confront all these guys. So I, they called me in. It was like kangaroo court. It's like, you know, like five, like 
guys who are ready to like put you know bang the gavel and says guilty. You know? <laughs> I'm sitting there like, what the hell is going on? Like, you know, we're in trouble and we're not going to be able to make this movie. And, oh my god! And all I could say was, I'm sorry. I haven't. <laughs> I haven't slept in four weeks. I'm doing the best I can, you know. I, I'm just like, if you want to fire me, well, that's completely up to you. I'm not, I'm not going to contest it, you know. And and I'm just trying to make the best film I can with what I have. And so I left that meeting. I guess a decision came down that they're going to, the guy who was funding the film was going to sell some films off of his library to finish the film. Mm. So he asked me, get us out as fast as you can. So I got us out three days early, mm. you know, and that saved, that saved a chunk of change. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, so months, a couple months later, we're shooting pickups. We're doing all this, you know, all this, uh, uh miniature stuff and explosions and, and crap. Did you have a rough and, cut by this point? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I had a rough cut. And it was all so looking I, good. And yeah, it was all looking good. Oh yeah. Yeah. So we did the first rough cut screening and I was, I was, I had an unfortunate, um, I was unfortunate enough to have to walk with the, the the financier of the film back. The guy who told me he had no confidence in me directing comedy. Oh, so he looked at it, and the whole time, I think it was a like 10-minute walk back to the office, and the whole time he was saying, do you know why the comedy works? And he proceeded to explain to me why all my ad-libs in the film worked. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and then I was so supposed obnoxious. to do another film with him, and 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 he just says, I'm a little concerned about the next movie because you know it, it you know it's so serious. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, you can't make this shit up. That is yeah, that's too yeah, classic. This man. is Hollywood, you know. <laughs> you can't make it up. I'm saying, okay, so first I couldn't direct comedy and now I can't direct drama. <laughs> so so what do you what am I good for? Amazing. What am I supposed to do? Yeah, you know. Amazing. Um so anyway, so so then we were shooting the miniatures and then one of the bond company uh representatives was was there. And she's like, Hey, how's it going? And I was like, Oh, you're talking to me. And she <laughs> said, she says, well, why wouldn't I talk to you? I said, well, I thought I was public enemy number one, you know. Uh, she says, oh, you were. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, okay, well, what changed? She says, well, it was Harry there, and, and we did find a solution. And I said, well, I'm just curious, just for my own information. Why didn't you guys fire me that day? Because you could have just totally fired me and whatever. And she says, well, two reasons. She says, A, we loved everything we were seeing. It wasn't anything right. to do with whether or not you were doing a good job or not. Right. Uh, and B, you were like indestructible. You hadn't slept in four weeks. Right. You had another, and you had another week and a half to go. And there's no way we could find anybody to replace yeah, you. Yeah, right. That was actually pretty smart of them to not yeah. fire And you. I said, okay, well, that makes sense. You know, I, I thanked them for being honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That was kind of funny. And then the film, then then we, fin- we finished the film. It was taken to the market um, in Mi- Mifed in Italy. Right at that point, I ran out of money. I had to go back to work at ADI, you know, to be a sculptor. And I get a, I get a call from one of the reps in Italy from the company and says, "Are oh, you ready for some bad news?" I said, "What's going on?" He says, "Well, no one wanted to buy the movie. It was, it was a disaster." And I said, well, "How can it be a disaster? Yeah. Because all our tests, everything was fantastic. It was a great know? movie. I remember watching. I remember when I saw it. You you gave me a copy. I couldn't believe it. I was like, yeah. it's fucking so amazing.'" So I heard that and it was like heartbreaking. I thought, whatever, you know. And then so then I got word. We're going to have to recut it, and we're going to have to redo the music. And I thought, what the hell is going on? And then so they – it took like another six months, and it was just hell dealing with this. you know. And they, they, they just like – basically, it's like they're just like killing your baby. you know. They, they start cutting limbs off, and they yeah, started right. to have crazy hairstyle. And, and they, they rescored it with a terribly cheap score, and then they cut the movie, cut all the heart and soul out of the movie. Oh, the sto- God. Basically, the story – and then we tested my version against the, the new version, and consistently my version always tested higher, right? Way higher than than that one. I even got I even had the paper to prove it. The NR the company NRG that tests all the big studio movies tested our films, and a guy came up to me and says, "You know, your little movie is testing higher than all the big action films coming out by the studio this summer." You know, so so you know, so I, I did at the point I was just confused. I didn't know what right. to say. Like, well, why is this being recut? Why is nobody buying it? You right. know. Uh, two years later, I found out it was all a lie. It was all a lie. What happened was there was, this, there was these guys from from England that was uh, releasing the film. They had heard about the director's cut. And this guy was already a big fan of the film. He had seen the short version, mm. and they and they had bought the film. So he said, I want to re- release your cut. So they came here. I helped them make, do a, make a documentary you know, and do all the stuff for it. And I just said – and then the guy said to me, he says, what happened with this film? I said, well, what do you mean what happened? It went to the market. Nobody wanted to buy it. He says, that's bullshit. He says, I was at that market. 
I was there trying to sell John Woo's movies and before John Woo became popular here. And everybody knew me as the guy who brought these Asian films. And everybody just said, no, put that down. You need to go see this movie called Drive. And uh, so he went to go see it. And he came out like, holy shit. Like this guy made the first successful American, you know, Hong Kong action crossover that right. works for an American audience. Yeah. And, and he says the whole festival was buzzing about your film. Everybody wanted this film. I stood right there next to the guys from uh, um, uh, Dimension Films. Uh, what's the one owned by Bob and uh, Weinstein? Uh, anyway, they I was standing right there, and they made an offer to take this film theatrical, and the guy turned it down. Okay. Because because <laughs> he says he wanted a ton of money because it was but the whole festival was buzzing with this film. He wanted a ton of money, and they told him we can't give you this ton of money because we're going to spend that ton of money advertising this film because you don't have any names big right. enough to draw. So we have to go out there and get people make, you know, make a make noise because we're confident once people come in and see this movie, word of mouth is going to carry it. Right. But the guy was so short sighted that the investor was like, he's like, nah, I, <sighs> I want my money. So he, so he thought to himself, well, maybe the movie's too long. Well, maybe it needs a new score. So right. he made, talked to the whole story, told me that no one wanted to buy it when in fact it was completely false. He didn't sell it. Oh my he did, he God. He sell it. That's so, yeah. so heartbreaking. Yeah. And then and then on the night that it came out, uh, it ended up, you know, he ended up uh, butchering the film, messed it all up, and then sold it to HBO uh, because HBO paid the most money up front. Wow. Uh, it, so it premiered on HBO on the same night that Titanic came out. And that night, instead of watching my film, I went to go see Titanic. Well, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, you know what? I, I want to go see a real movie. I don't, I don't want to see a yeah. butchered yeah. version. You know, I was so pissed. Well, and then, and then what? And then you know, Rush Hour comes out. How long after that? Because yeah, basically, yeah. it was like a Rush Hour type film. It was it was like a mm -hmm. black dude and an Asian dude, and it was like a comedy buddy film. There was, a lot, there was a lot of coincidental things that happened in there. That was exactly in my film. Right, you know? right. Yeah. The opening scene: he, Jackie Chan, stole away on a boat. That's the opening scene of my right. film. <laughs> <laughs> so and and that was just this he, he, mega hit. I mean, this is yeah. wild for some of the younger listeners. I mean, it was a Rush Hour was a huge fucking movie, yeah. and I just I remember when I <laughs> I don't think you even really mentioned anything about what happened when you showed me when you when you gave me the 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 movie to watch, and I was like I immediately I was like this is you know this is better than Rush Hour, and it's like you know and they 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 uh. It just seemed like it made it even more tragic. Not only did they kind of ruin your vision and, you know, you ruin this heroic effort you made to make this against all odds. Then it gets, you know, either ripped off or whatever. But then yeah. it gets, you know, the hit it should have been with yours ends up happening to Rush Hour. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, because yep. Rush Hour came out like a year and a half later or something. And, right. And, and Kadeem Hardison, is, he's actually friends with uh, uh, Brett Ratner. Uh, and I remember he showed he showed Brett Ratner the film, and uh, Brett was just like, "Holy shit! If your film had come out, we never would have made could have made a right Rush Hour." Right. Yeah. So, so I mean, that must have didn't that completely fuck you up? Yeah. Emotionally, I mean, yeah. I would have been crying. <laughs> I would have been like, very. I mean, it seems like something like that could really, you know, make you depressed and bummed out. And yeah, God. yeah, it was. It it fucked me up. I didn't. I didn't cry, but. Um, <laughs> I would have. Yeah, maybe maybe there were tears of laughter after a while. It's just of the insan the pure insanity of, of the whole situation. Um, but you know what? I'm glad it happened. I have really? to be honest. I'm glad it happened because so many wonderful things happened to me in my life uh, that would never have happened if I stayed that path, that right, course of being right. a director. Right. You know, that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so I felt like it, it just wasn't time. For yeah, me to, yeah. to to have that success, you know, no matter how heartbreaking it was at the time, right? And and then also too, uh, just it, it forced me to grow up. You know, the the best the best uh, thing that was ever said to me that finally made me realize what was how, how the world really worked was when I was telling my my ex wife's uncle about the situation, and you know, because he worked in the film industry as well, and he basically I expected sympathy from him, and you know what he said? Hmm. He just says, "I'll oh, grow up." <laughs> <laughs> i was so offended at the time i was like what how can you say that that's like blaming the victim you right. know 
And then I had a chance to kind of reflect and think about it. And I, I finally, I, I understood his wisdom. Right. And I realized you're right. Yep. It's, it's not a fair world. Yeah, You know, exactly. if you want to play with wolves, get ready to get your ass bitten off. Right, right. Be, be prepared for that possibility. <laughs> yeah. And and it, it made life much easier after that. When yeah. You know that you're playing a dangerous game. Right. You, know, you, can, you can choose to participate or you can choose not to. But if right. you do, understand the rules. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I I, I I was just talking to I can't remember. I see, I can't even remember what guest was on last week. But um, I think the last guest, or maybe the one before, I was t- I was talking about how, um, you know, if you're happy where you are now, you can you can look back at all these horrible things that happened to you, and then finally appreciate them and, and be grateful actually for mm-hmm. those things because you're happy where you are now, and you're like you, <clears throat> you see a pattern like a positive pattern in your life, and, and you know what I mean. Yeah, because I, I literally before I got back into effects, I uh, I had written a list, you know, the the pros and cons list. Mm-hmm. Like as a director, what did I like? What did I, what didn't I like? You know, as a as a, a artist, what did I like? What didn't I like? And it was so obvious I needed to be an artist, right? <laughs> and not a and not a filmmaker, right? Because right. you know, because you know, doing making films, you're miserable so much you're right. angry so much you're dealing with such shitty people so much I bet, yeah. and it's just like man unless you can fully control how the thing goes down you know and have, have autonomy it's very difficult and whereas being an artist i was just like let me see what's the worst thing that can happen oh not a whole lot right you know <laughs> it's like what's the best thing that can happen Oh, I'm just constantly having fun and enjoying what I do. Right. <laughs> and, and so I was like, I was like, I'm I'm going back in, you know. And and what was great was that when I was at ADI, which was 1996, from there up to now, I think I only re, I only had one burnout period about maybe two years ago, where mm-hmm. for about six to eight months, I was just like, oh, I'm exhausted, I'm burnt out, I'm not really feeling it, I'm not enthusiastic about it, you mm-hmm. know. And it eventually came back. Um, but, but you're, you're talking a span of like 20, almost 24 years where I was excited to go to work right. every day. I, I just like, I have too many things I want to sculpt, too many things I want to paint, too many things I want to do, and I can't get enough of it. You know, right. even right now, I go home like 10 o'clock at night. I bring my computer home because I want to work on my ZBrush sculpt when I get home. Yeah. You know, after a full, you know, 12, 14 hour days at work, I still go home and I want to do this at home. Like, I, yeah. I, this energy that I have for this work has become stronger over time. Right. Um, and that was what I got out of taking a hiatus from it by going to go make movies and, and get my ass right. kicked. Yeah. 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 Wow, that's amazing. Well, that's a, um, I mean, that's a, that means you're where you're supposed to be, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, and I'm trying to get back into films again, but, I'm, you know, I, I actually, uh, I have a script that uh, my writing partner, Aaron Dobson, in England wrote. He and I wrote so many iterations of this over five years but we finally locked down on, on the final version of it um which we'll see how final it is when, if we get funded <laughs> yeah but but you know i'm talking to i'm talking to a producer about it right now who was very enthusiastic about it about getting it funded That's so hopefully cool. i can get it funded it's a it's a horror film like a, a supernatural detective thriller oh excellent. you know that something different great. different for me because over the years like i'm always known as the kung fu guy the, yeah. the monster guy whatever but my tastes have changed a lot now mm-hmm. and i'm more into like a darker brooding kind of you know intricate stories with really interesting characters. And so I'm really excited about trying to get this film funded because I really kind of want to move in a different direction of, of, of films to make. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm really excited about it. So Yeah, that yeah. sounds amazing. And I bet filmmaking has changed a lot since back then. I mean, everything's oh, they, do you mean, digital. Uh, I mean, tech, technologically, it's like a whole yeah, different yeah. ball game as far as, yeah. you know, checking the gate and all that stuff. And Yeah, it actually, <laughs> well, actually, 2007... Uh, I actually took three years off to go produce a, a TV show. Oh, the that's kids. right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. was what that? Was, was, that was a. Uh... It was called Common Writer Dragon Knight. That's a, right. Yeah, it was. It started airing in 2009, and they aired all all entire 2009 on CW for Kids Network. Right. Uh, every Saturday morning, and that was really fun. Uh, it was challenging, but again, you know, we got to. It was all shot digital, um, and it's one of those again one of those jobs where uh, I was the executive producer on it with my brother Mike. And my job was basically in charge of everything creative. So, oh, cool. Yeah, I was just like from story to. You're like the uh, showrunner, kind of. Oh, yeah, I was, I was, I was a showrunner. Yeah. Wow. 
And so it was kind of weird to be put in charge of like, well, here's a 40 episode TV show. <laughs> you got to you got to make it up now. Wow. So, so I assembled a little team. You know, I have Nathan Long, who was one of the, one of the script writers with me on Guyver 2. You know, we, we had done a lot of scripts together in the past. Mm-hmm. I brought him on as a head story editor and also one of the, our, our writers. Uh, I had Colin Gillis, Al Gillis's brother from mm-hmm. ADI. Was one of my staff writers, you know. Cool. And so we had, I think we had three or four writers. Scott Phillips, who wrote Drive, was on on there. And so we uh, basically worked on this forty script thing, and we we shot it over one hundred and twenty days with weekends off, you know, with four different directors, including myself. Wow. And um, it was crazy because you know ultimately, like you know, I knew that we have to have two units. One is shooting, one's prepping. One shooting, one's prepping. Kind of, you know, and then the crew is the same. So the crew just goes completely all the way through and then um so i had to kind of had to kind of create a machine that would run itself right and that worked out really well we never went over budget we you know we did really well on, on that amazing yeah uh and then mark allen was my visual effects supervisor and it was amazing he put together a team around the world and we worked on we worked through a server on the internet wow, an encrypted yeah. server yeah so i was interfacing because i was i was kind of the the art art directing all the visual effects as well so um it was kind of weird to be able to to work with like a team of artists all over the world that I've never met. Right. Uh, you know, and then, and, but we got over like two thousand something effect shots done during wow. that period. Wow. And so that was that was really cool. And then learning about the digital technology, the different cameras and the lenses that you use, and the, yeah, so it was very educational for me. Wow. Yeah. How did you get? How did you get that gig? Complete fucking um, <laughs> nepotism. <laughs> You know, because they say it's true, right? In this business, it's yeah. not what you know; it's who you know. It's so true. And and the one of the executive producers, a guy named Aki Komine, I had worked with him on on one of the Guyver movies, and also on Drive. So he had he had uh, uh, put this whole deal together in Japan, and so he came out and he said, "Hey, I got this. I know you're a huge Kamen Rider fan. Do you want to make this as a TV show?" And I was like, "Fuck yeah! I mean, yeah. I think <laughs> if you can do it." And a few months later, he came back and says, "He says we're we're, we're doing it." You know, and wow. so he brought me in. So you know, you make the show, we'll fund it, and that's, that's how it. That's, that's how because I, I never would have. No one would ever hire me as a showrunner because right. I don't have a track record. Right. For, but at least I proved that I could do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, in fact, in fact, we were so we were we were so. Um, I don't want to like, uh, I don't want to like, uh, you know, boast or anything like that because that's kind of stupid. But, but we did such a good job for on that show. In fact, we were meeting with Disney about pitching other shows. At one point, they came to us and one of my brother and I to take over another show that that was kind of in trouble. Wow! To, to be to be showrunners on that because they love everything they were seeing and what we were doing. Wow! So that ended up not happening because the show they got into some sort of contract snafu with the original mm. creators, so they had to let them finish out. And then instead of doing season two, they canceled it all together. Right. But had they done season two and they were able to get around it, we would have gotten hired to take over season two. Wow. Which would have been a great experience just to, to learn how things run. I'm sure it would have been hell. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but but you know, but it would just be very educational. Right. To to learn that process. Yeah. It's so cool to that I mean, uh, have you ever I I imagine you've never turned something down because it was too daunting? Because it's like yeah. it seems seems like <clears throat> you, you, you get offered I mean, these are scary things to do for the first time. Like, yes. you know, directing your first movie, being a showrunner, you've never done that before. I mean, it's, it takes a lot of courage to do that. So it's, I mean, are you, you're just one, of, one of those kind of people. <laughs> stupid. No. I'm no, an you, idiot. <laughs> I'm an idiot. It's like, hey, you want to do this? Uh, what? 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 I've never done this before. It's probably going to be super difficult and super hard to pull off. Okay. <laughs> No, I think it's amazing. It's commendable. I mean, it's brave to be able to, you know, to do that and like have the self confidence to be able to say yes to stuff like that. You know, that's how you make it in the business. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I don't, I don't think much about that to be honest with you. I, di- I guess I, I just kind of get excited, like, oh, something cool, something new, <laughs> you know. And I'm, I'm always up for something new. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's one thing is I, I, I have always known very, from very young age that technology is what sort of governs our existence you right. know and you don't you know advancements in in technology and science you know and and if you don't go with what is current you become you get left behind right hence the the zbrush exactly so you do zbrush and stuff now yeah i'm still i'm still doing it i mean 
you know, like I do ZBrush mostly for my own personal stuff. You know, mm. I make collectibles with them. I do my own sculptures, but I'm very well versed in the digital side of the technology. Right. Like when you know, I have my studio, I work with digital artists all the time. A lot of the projects that we do, uh, like you know, generally about half of them are digital. Mm. And even if and even if we, if the project is going to be built uh, traditionally, I will still do a lot of the planning in digital. Like right. for instance. Uh, you know, we did a, a, a quarter scale X-Wing fighter for, for Korea for a film promotion. And the first thing I, I knew was like, OK, shit, we have four and a half weeks to build this X-Wing. It has to be screen accurate. And so what's the best way to do it? I can't just go in the back and say, OK, let's build an X-Wing. I, I got to have a plan, right? <laughs> right. I gotta, you know, so so the first thing I did was like we got a model of an X-Wing and I took it uh, and worked with my digital artists. I spent a week basically saying, here's how we're going to build it. We're going to have this kind of structure. Here's the size of the armature, the the speed rails for that's going to do this. Right. I need this to be cut into this many sections. We're going to put styrofoam sections in between. And they're going to be at this angle, at this thickness. So model all this into the model so that we can take measurements. So essentially, and then we're going to have like, you know, this thick uh, uh, skin, styrene skin on here. And then this, this layer of that and this. And here we're going to build, hand build this. We're going to do, you know, so all this stuff was basically planned out. So we had a digital model of how this whole thing would come apart. Wow. With, you know, in a week's time. And right. then from that point, I generated all the life-size blueprints, actual size. And they can hand it to, here you go, you make this, you make this, oh, you make cool. this, you yeah. make this. And it all comes together. Wow. And that's, and that's how we're able to do it in such a short time is that, you know, I figured out how we're going to do it right from day one. And then everybody just follows the plan. Right. Otherwise, right. it's complete chaos. And in fact, what was, what was cool about the whole thing was a year later, I went to a convention and I met... There's a guy named Steve. I've got his last name, but I, I met him. Uh, he w- he works for Disney, and he's the official model maker for for Lucasfilm, Star Wars, representing Disney. Wow! So he builds all the models for them, you know, screen accurate stuff. And I showed him photos of our X wing that we built. And he <laughs> says, "Holy shit! Can I tell you, your thing is completely screen accurate." Wow! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we tried. That's amazing. Yeah, he was yeah. impressed. That it was screen accurate. Wow. Yeah, because I remember we're there cutting wood, and I'm building the back part of the engine out of wood. And I'm sitting there going, "I'm not the model maker. What am I doing? I'm right. making the model." You yeah, know? that's what... all. My whole team, we're all cutting stuff, or it's built completely traditionally. Right. But we, right. But we planned it out digitally because digital is a powerful tool if you know how to use it yeah, to your advantage. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's the that's the key. You know, everybody says it, but so few people use it that way. But really the you know, when you, you when you meld the two technologies, practical and digital, it's always mm-hmm. it makes the most sense. You always get the best result if you use them in the right way, I think. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that that's kind of uh amazing that you're doing these I mean, are you are you you're not just doing organic creatures. You're doing props. You're kind of mm-hmm. doing anything yeah. anybody specialty brings your costumes, way. Specialty costumes, robots. Stuff. Really? Specialty costumes yeah. and uh-huh. stuff too? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've done a bunch of those, yeah. Damn. Amazing. Yeah. I think it's so cool. I yeah, digital, digital, digital is awesome. I mean, yeah, it's, it is. I'm, I'm not like a traditionalist or, or, you know, I'm not anti-digital at all, but I still see the value of tradition because we do a lot of the traditional stuff. Like this last statue we did, uh, Lilith, you know, she was she was done traditionally for the most part. Mm. But then the armature we used, the 3D model for the armature, and so we basically used that and built our armature from that, just so that we were ensure that the scale of it is. is oh, active. that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a perfect example of why you would use digital technology, so you can mm-hmm. scale something up easily and not have to worry yeah. about problems like yeah. that. But then the detail and the and the, and the, the skin work on it, it's like right. You, we could do it better in clay. Right, yeah. right. So we do it in clay. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's whatever the quality is, whatever garners us the best quality is, is the direction that we go in. Yeah. And, and my wife, she's insane. She was actually she was actually dubbed by Blizzard Entertainment artists uh, the human 3D printer. <laughs> Why is that? Yeah, because she, you know, she's like, I don't know, she, she's amazingly talented. And I'm not just saying this because she's my wife. Because at, at one point, she wasn't my wife. Right. <laughs> she, she was one of the head art directors in my studio. And um, we had this base that we had to recreate, right? We had, we had this one-fifth scale maquette that we printed that they made. Um, but we had to scale this thing up. So I was give her that job because she's she's crazy, like, you know, meticulous. Hmm. And so I just see her, like, you know, measuring everything and with all this stuff off the model. And she's drawing these scale drawings, elevations, you know, every six inches, it's this drawing. Every six inches, and she has a, a, the color coded and all this wow. crazy. I couldn't even wrap my head around it. <laughs> and then she blows it up, and she transfers it to styrofoam in those layers. And she spends, like, a few days cutting them all out and then gluing them together. And then 
then she starts to carve it out. And once, once she's done, you look at it and it's identical to the little one. That's amazing. You know, and, and the blizzard guys came in and saw she was doing it. And they're like, holy shit. <laughs> it's like, you are a human 3D printer. <laughs> That's great. It's nuts. And I'm like, I didn't teach her how to do that. Wow. Like she, she's smart, you know? Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So what is she? She works, she does a, a sculpture and, and design yeah, she, and stuff yeah, for you? Yeah, she, she's one of my head art directors. Uh, okay. Uh, studio. So she'll do a lot of sculpting. Nowadays, I, I hand her I hand off a lot of the main sculptures to her, like the faces, the heads. Mm-hmm. And she, she and I sometimes will work together on it, or sometimes she'll just do it all on her own. Um, and then we watch each other's back and like we both are direct. Mm. So if I say something that seems to be kind of not so great, she might point it out to me and say, Hey, what about this? What mm-hmm. about that? You know? So we compliment each other in, in, in that respect. That's great. Uh, and then anything, anything meticulous, like calligraphy, all this crazy like stuff that like, you know, uh, and, and I don't want to be like all like misogynistic or, or shit like that. But <laughs> I think some of these things, women are just naturally better at it than men. Right, doing fine detail it's work. Fine meticulous stuff. Yeah, because she's so good at it, and like if, if she if it shattered to me, she, I would piss her off. Yeah, <laughs> okay, try to paint this thing. She'd be like, "That's a mess. What are you doing?" <laughs> I would just hand it to her. No, honey, you do it. And it'll come back beautiful. You know, wow. like, it's like yeah, that's amazing. So, that's cool yeah. though. I mean, that's 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 a uh, that's what a cool working relationship you have with her. That's yeah, awesome. and she's yeah, she's nuts. Like she'll she'll she always wants to stay longer than I do. We'll wow. be here like four. 16 hours i'm like we gotta go home oh wait just give me another give me, i just need another hour i'm like <laughs> and then we go home as we're driving home she's sculpting in the car <laughs> wow <laughs> and then we get home and then she's sculpting at the kitchen table and you i'm found, like you okay. found somebody as obsessed with sculpture as you yeah yeah she really <laughs> is. And, and you know and i'm just like no we gotta get lights out every night's like prison i just say okay <laughs> lights out <laughs> So, are you doing any um, any work at any other shops? Or are you like you only <clears throat> work for your own shop at this? Yeah, point? I've, I've only been doing my own stuff for the last, I guess, eleven eleven years. Oh, cool. 10, 11 years. Wow, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, uh, you don't you don't miss the days where you're just told to do something and you come in and put your eight hours in and go home. Oh my god, I miss <laughs> that so much. Are you kidding me? I, I look hate- back. I look back in those those you know Planet of the Apes days and mm-hmm. Haunted Mansion and where it was just like, you know, especially during the maquette phase where they're just no one's even really, you know, keeping track of anything. They're just kind of letting you sculpt whatever. And yeah, you know what? You know what I miss the most? I miss the company. Yeah, like, you know, working with you, working with Mitch, yeah. you know, with Matt. Same here. You know, Joey, like all these, all the like, all the top guys in our business. I miss working with you guys yeah. because in my studio. Like I'm the head guy yeah. and I'm doing stuff and things, you know, on occasion I could bring in like an A-list guy if we can afford it or something. But I, I just miss being around people who are so good that I, I be around and learn something. Right, right. Like, oh, wow. That's a cool. I never saw it that way. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. So, like, you miss that kind of feedback. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then and then also, too, the, the idea of sitting down for eight hours and getting the sculpt. That's like a dream come true. I know, right? I haven't had that opportunity in like eleven years. Yeah, once you're the boss, man, you got to deal with all the bullshit. You I'm don't get to do running, the fun stuff as much. I'm running the business. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. But I still want to do the artwork. I'm still yeah. super passionate. So what happens is they'll say, "Oh, well, can you sculpt this here?" Like I'll be like, "Oh, I want to sculpt this part of it." Okay, okay, we're gonna mold this in two weeks from now. Okay, cool. Three weeks later, I'm done. Yeah, because I literally <laughs> can only spend an hour a day on it. You yeah. Know? Because I have to walk around and art direct and do this and yeah. that and then figure out how to build this and you know, right. and so it's constant. And then so the only my my day doesn't really start until like six o'clock when everybody's gone. Right. Because I could just sit and at least put in another five hours to to sculpt. Right. So I can just try to catch up and and do something that I want to do. Yeah, yeah. It's been like this for years, and and the hardest part is literally like every 15, 20 minutes you finally get in the zone. You need to come look at this. Fuck. You <laughs> yeah. Come back. You're working. You finally get in the zone. I need you come look at this, and it's all day. And, and you know, and, and at one time, I remember like three, four years ago, I asked my my wife, who was not my wife at the time, and I said, you know, I, I want to move you up to being an art director. You know, can you can you art direct and also you know do the work? And she says, okay, yeah, I want to try it. You know, and she got into it, the scheduling and she got into art directing and whatever. And one time she woke up crying in the middle of the night. She's just like, I can't do it. Oh I can't God. do it. I'm just like, I, I, I can't be yanked out of my zone constantly right. all day. It's fucking torture. 
I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> you have a choice. You can just tell me go fuck off, yeah. and, I'm, and I'll just go fuck off. And I did. I was like, okay, you be an artist again, you know. Right. But like me, I can't tell myself to fuck off. Who else is gonna do it? Right, right. And so, yeah, and I'm still doing that, literally. Yeah. It's, but that's yeah. that's the you know that's the flip side of having, I guess, um, I don't know, a certain amount of ambition, mm-hmm. you know, because because I, I kind of um, I respect dudes shop dudes that can be like i'm gonna work for someone i'm gonna bounce around to different shops i'm gonna mm-hmm. do my job i enjoy it and 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 find their place in that yeah you know but yeah, i but, missed that a lot actually. i know me too it's like there's a there it, it was really fun it really yeah. was was fun but 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 i i mean towards the end for me <clears> it was just like I, I I wanted to go further. I had an idea. Mm-hmm. I wanted to do my own stuff, and it was like that was just eating at me. So I had to, I had to do that. Now it's like, you know, I'm in the day. I'm dealing with all kinds of business shit, and it's yeah. like I get started in the afternoon or evening, and, it, and it's mm-hmm. the same thing. It's like I've got some uh, people that come and help me during the day, and it's like, you know, I have to wait till everyone leaves, and all my business stuff is done, and then I get to do you know work on art stuff, and yeah. it's like, but. And as the business grows, as my business grows, it's like it gets more and more like that. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, it's just there's always going to be some fucked up thing about it, no matter yeah. what you do. Yeah, you know? and it's hard for you because you're selling essentially your artwork. Right. So you can't just bring somebody else in and do your artwork. I know, I know, well, I know. What I'm doing is, like, you know, the stuff the stuff I built, I can't do it by myself. I got to have oh, a, yeah, a big, you have to a have big a team. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, but I still have to, you know, oversee it, supervise it, engineer it, you know. Right. And, and so – yeah, so I, a lot of times I wish I was the guy who didn't really care about the art side of it. You know, yeah, like, I'm, know. I'm like, like, yeah, I do it, but I don't need to do it and just run the business. But I'm just not that guy. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm, 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 I guess it's kind of rare out here. Like, there's only a small handful of shop owners that actually still do the right. work. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, I, I still I still do the work. Yeah, that's that, you know? I was going to say that is that, you know, you're you're such a gr- an amazing sculptor. I mean, you're you everybody in the business knows you're definitely like the at the very top tier of sculptors in the business Thank you. Thank and you so uh it's you know your work's amazing everybody knows it and uh so for you to completely take a supervisory role would just be a shame like you know cuz yeah. you're you're a sculptor you're you're a born sculptor um i remember one one thing that you i don't remember who you were t- talking to uh, and this may not sound like a big revelation now, but at the time it was the first time I ever heard it. And you were, t- I think you were talking to someone else, like giving someone like a younger sculptor, some advice. It was at Rick's, I think. Was and- it get off my lawn? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> get off my lawn. You whippersnapper. <laughs> it was Mitch. Stop farting on me. Yeah, no, yeah. no, it was, uh, you were, you were, you were talking about sculpting and you were kind of showing them and you were saying, and you said, you have to find it. You have to find the sculpture in there. And I was like, it was just like, that to me was like, I'd never heard it put that way. That's exactly what it is. You're mm-hmm. trying to find it. It's yeah. in there somewhere and you're searching for it while you're sculpting. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that was like, yeah. wow, that was like one of those big moments for me. Like that's, that's, that's some sculpting wisdom right there. Yeah. You well, I, it's, yeah, it, it comes with a heavy baggage too, because when I'm trying to explain to, to people here, like my partner, we're working, you know, like, you know, he always takes offense when I talk about the difference between doing a technical job versus an artistic job, because mm. he comes he comes from the background of everybody always shitting on him and and saying, you know, well, I'm a sculptor and you All guys right. make molds, so you're not important and we're important. And so there's already kind of that instant defense, like he tightens up whenever right. I talk about the process of doing art. And I just said to him, like, I'm sorry, it's not the same. You know, if you ask me to make a mold of something, unless it's something so freaking intricate and new that I've never done before, I know the process. I know what I have to do. I know where I have to shim it. I know how long it's going to take for the material to right. set. I got a basic good idea of what this is go- how this is going to go down. When you tell me, oh, uh, sculpt something great, you know, <laughs> I can't tell you how it's going to go down. Right. No matter how many years I've been sculpting, I can't, I've been sculpting over 40-some years. I can't tell you how many how long it's going to take because there's the process of exploration finding it yeah you know like and and if i don't quite i can do it and then like walk away and come back next day and go oh this is complete garbage right i gotta fucking redo it again and do something different you know it's like i said i don't know i can't that's unpredictable yeah it's, that unpredictable it's not factor. A, yeah and it's not an intellectual process really it's no. like it's a feeling it's like 
it can everything can look right on a sculpture but if something's not feeling right about it it's not all the way there and you can't like it's not like oh because this is half an inch off it's like you're getting at least i think you're probably this way too you know i'm really intuitive with you know how i'm when i'm judging my artwork it's like you're feeling it if it doesn't feel right if it feels off then it's not done you know what i mean yeah and the thing you don't hear you don't hear that much from people who've been sculpting as long as you and i but I say it all the time because I'm very, I'm very transparent about my feelings, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 you know, if something doesn't go down well, something looks bad to me, I'd be the first to say it. All right. You know, and people think, oh, you can do no wrong. You're, you're fucking Steve Wang. You've, you've, you've been sculpting for so long. And I'm just like, you don't understand the dangers of knowing what you already know and then to sit down and do a sculpture that looks bad. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, entirely possible right. not just possible it happens a lot yeah. more than, than you think you know like I'll, I'll sculpt something and people go oh wow that is so great and i'm looking at them like thank god they can't tell <laughs> because it's terrible totally. like yeah this i completely missed this part of it this part sucks i right, wish i could correct right, it now, but i right. can't yeah. yeah it's like that kind of stuff you know and 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 you know everybody i mean to be fair everybody reach a certain level they have their own sort of battles they go through right you know, it seems like the better you get, the more you understand you don't know shit. Right. And that that is such a true statement. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And that's 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 the whole thing. And 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 for me, it, for me, it's like the better you get, the more times you're gonna do bad work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, because but, you'll know it's not as yeah. good as it could be. Yeah. The the best people always, all the best people, the really good ones, are the ones that have that attitude of like you know a, a certain humility because they re you get to a certain point. And then, you, like you said, you realize, you know, that it's, it's, you're, you're not the greatest thing since sliced bread. All the, you know, the old masters have kind of run circles around all of us hundreds of years ago and they were doing that shit in marble and, yeah. you know, and, and it's, you, you get that appreciation for it. And it's usually the people that have the, the attitudes are the ones that aren't really, they're not mm -hmm. all the way there yet, you know. Yeah, it's because like, they can't they can't see the fuck ups. Right. <laughs> That's the yeah. problem. They can't see to, the fuck ups. You have to <laughs> be able so to see good, the fuck ups. When you get to the point where you're so good, you can see all your fuck ups. Yep. Then you really know you're really not that good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that shows that you're really good. <laughs> yeah, because you're not that good. Yeah. I I think it's the fear of of knowing at this point in your life you can still fuck up horribly right. is what keeps me humble. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I'm just like I'm never gonna go out there and boast of my own work and go how great this is because I know that my next sculpture could be a complete piece of shit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's you know that's one of the things I always liked about you is, is I I always felt like you were easy to be around and not easy to offend. You're yeah. like you're just like I, I've you know I always felt like I could kind of tell you anything. And, and you wouldn't get like offended or, you know, just You're not certain... sleeping with my wife. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm about, I'm about to tell you right now something. Yeah. No, I, 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 you know what I mean? It's like some people, I don't know. You don't feel like you can kind of be honest with them. Yeah. I'm not talking about your work. I'm talking just about anything, anything in general. It's like, I always just, you know, you just seem like a kind of guy that's easy to, to, I don't know, be well, around you know... and talk to and discuss art and stuff and that and the, you don't you don't seem to take things like not that we ever got in a confrontation or anything but you just seem like you never really took things personally when you know no, and you're I, always I, really easy going with i make it a point not to take anything personal that's actually part of my life mantra you know mm. <clears throat> don't take anything personal um it's it's the four agreements actually that it's, right. a, it's a tape that I, I had listened to years ago and it makes so much sense to me yeah the agreements was don't take anything personal right because when you don't take anything personal no, no one can offend you yeah you know, i had people come up to me at conventions and go i really hated this thing you did that was terrible to which i thank them for the honesty and say hey thank you, you know, right I, i'll try to do better <laughs> and just don't take anything personal um and always do your best because if you're yeah. doing your best even if you fuck up you done you tried your best right right and then you can, go, you can sleep at night yeah yeah yeah. <clears throat> and then so yeah and and there's there's two other ones too but but for me it's always you know i made a choice and i i have to say i was blessed early in my life earlier in my life to kind of understand the world a little better and and i realized that you know 
you see people that grow old and they get so bitter mm-hmm. about everything. And you see people that are like so chill and so happy with life. Right. So, well, why is that? And I thought, right. you know what? You know, happiness is a choice. Because if somebody says something to me, you can choose to be angry or you can choose to not let it affect you and look at the positive side of things. Right. You can turn, somebody gives you a lemon, you can turn it into lemonade. Mm-hmm. It's really your choice. Yeah, yeah. So early on in my life, I chose to be happy. Wow. And by choosing to be happy, you you have to follow certain rules like, okay, well, then this really should never matter. And right. that should never matter. You know, getting offended by somebody not liking your work, it's their right to not like your work. Right. And, and so they don't like your work. Who cares? The, the <laughs> life goes on. Nothing changes. <laughs> right, right. You know what I mean? And for every person that hate your, hate your work, there's a, plenty of people that also like your work and, and that tells you how much you've influenced and, and inspired them as well. Right. So, you know, it's that's not not, the, not something you, you can control, but if you are even blessed enough to be able to inspire one person on this planet, that's a pretty that's a pretty amazing gift. Right. You know? Yeah, like, for that, sure. That you give, but then you also receive because it's a gift to be able to, be able to inspire someone. Right. It's a privilege. So, it's yeah, a privilege, exactly. You know? Exactly. So. Yeah, I, I just, I, 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 um, uh, you know, you, you've, you've always been, as long as I've known you in the business, you've always been like a big shot in the industry, but I've never felt any sense of ego from you. Like mm-hmm. you always just seem super easygoing and, and really chill. So I, I always, you know, enjoyed working with you for that reason. Oh, well, Aside from you. your your stuff's fucking crazy good, amazing. Well, well so is your work. I mean, you oh, know, thanks. I was seeing your praises when we were talking about the cave. I was like, oh yeah, Chet did this. He's fucking. <laughs> but thanks. You know, you know, you're you're one of you're one of the A list sculptors in our business. You oh, know? Thank and, you, and, thank and you. It was really a privilege to be able to work with you. I appreciate it. Yeah, the paint. I love the paint job. Those eyes on that thing. Or the paint job was so cool. I just I don't know. It was such a great design. I love that thing. Oh, thank you. I wish it could. I wish it was seen. <laughs> i quit i do i have to say i do i miss every once in a while i miss being in the shop and like i said hanging out like you were saying hanging out and sculpting i mean it's really in the best circumstances it's like you're hanging out with your friends in a garage when you were a kid and making yeah. monsters you know and then the, and the, and the conversations right always. right you know, when you're, when you're just having, you're just in a zone, you're sculpting oh, yeah, some stuff yeah. and you're having all kinds of crazy conversations about stuff, you know, those are always fun. Yeah, totally, man. I just, I, I really, you know, towards, towards the end of, of the, my effects career, I kind of, I got really bitter, like so bitter. And, um, you know, part of it was because I wasn't doing my own thing. Part of it, cause I was saying <laughs> I was working with Mitch. <laughs> 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 he kind of like, I was such, I, I mean, he, he. He t- he turned me on to the idea that, you know, you could be doing we're, – we're kind of treated poorly in the business from production, okay. you know? And I never really thought that much about it until he started, you know. You know, Mitch, he was always talking about that. Um, and and supremely, so – Supremely gifted, too smart for his own good. Yeah, fuck, he's, a, he's brilliant. He's a, yeah, 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 right. He's yeah, a genius. No, nothing but respect for Mitch. He, oh, yeah. he, blow, he blows me away, the yeah, stuff he does. Yeah, absolutely amazing. But um, uh, it, was, it, was, it, it was weird. It was almost like this phase I had to go through in my life where I got really bitter. And, and it was kind of what helped propel me out to do my own thing. And then when I got some distance from effects after about a year on my own – I was. I looked back and I was able to see it more clearly and, and appreciate it. What a mm-hmm. what an amazing time it was in, in that yeah. business and what a what an amazing business it is really. Because because mm-hmm. I, I mean, it's, I did a bunch of inter- interviews after I got out of FX and I was just like talking shit about the business so bad and producers mm-hmm. and blah 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 blah. And I you know I really, I've said it before. I really feel like the the anger was I at myself because I didn't have the balls to go and do what I wanted to do and mm-hmm. go and do my own thing, that could, which is yeah. what I wanted to do. And it's like, it's so unfair to project that onto other people. Sure. You know, if you don't like your circumstances, then fucking quit the job and go do what yeah. you want to do. You yeah. know what I mean? Well, and, and, and you did, and you were able to, you know, I think that, that was the best thing because I think good or bad, that situation was able to propel you For into sure. – no, it was good. Now. And, it, <laughs> it, it, and it was a growth. There's a lot of growing pains, but it was yeah, it's necessary. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. It was yeah. like looking back, it was like I, I'm so appreciative of all the bad times that helped get me to where I'm at, you know, because now I'm like, I feel like I'm really 
where I'm supposed to be in life, mm-hmm. you know. And, and but back then, that's where I was supposed to be too. I mean, I, my, since I was 12 years old, I was just like, "This is." I knew that's what I wanted to do is yeah. is is <clears throat> do makeup effects, and sculpt, and do creatures. And uh, and the funny thing is, when I was like in the first grade, I remember thinking, like fantasizing about being an artist, like a painter, mm-hmm. even though I was I was you know drawing and stuff. I wasn't really painting, so it was kind of like, okay, I got I. That was sort of my, you know, youngest memory is that I was an artist. And then I got to a point where it's like, it was the focus was completely makeup effects. So obsessed with it, like you were, I'm sure, mm-hmm. and, or about masks and stuff. Yeah. And I did that for, you know, how many years? And, and then it was like, okay, I'm ready to move on to the next stage of my life, basically, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and yeah, what, just just what I really loved about that whole process was, when, you know, as a kid when I was doing this in my in my bedroom, I don't think I ever stopped to think whether or not I was going to be good enough to right. do it. It yes. was always just I knew how long I was taking to do stuff. I knew, you know, by yeah. no frame reference of time, how long it takes to do the stuff in the movies. All I knew was that I, I just loved doing it. Yeah. And then and then uh, I think it wasn't until finally when I got into the business that I, then that notion finally hit me like. Oh my God! Am I actually good enough to even do this? <laughs> yeah, you know, right. <laughs> it's crazy. And and luckily, you know, like my first job was for Stan Winston, and it was basically running polyfoam and seaming, and I got to do a little bit of painting on set, and then I learned how to run, you know, set etiquette and stuff. It was really educational. Right. Uh, but then my second job, um, Rick Baker was hiring for Harry, and I went in there to show my Harry portfolio. And the Hendersons for people. Yeah, Harry the Hendersons. Sorry. <laughs> um, and. And I met with him and showed him my work. And at that point, it was when it hit me, like, what am I doing here? <laughs> this, guy's, this guy's my idol. Like, like he's my hero. And, and I wanted, you know, I idolize this man. Like, you know, the stuff, the work he's done inspired me, right. my, my core. And I'm here showing him this crap work that I'm, I'm doing to try to get a job. I'm like, I hope, I hope he hires me to at least make molds or something. Right. And I was shocked he brought me in to, to sculpt. You know, yeah, and, and, yeah. and but that was also kind of kind of affirming, too, because because um, then I kind of got a sense of, oh, OK, this is where these professionals think that kind of kind of what I'm at, what I'm capable of. Right. And it really it really kind of encouraged me to work harder and to try to get better because mm-hmm. the first day going to work, it was like that. It was like the, the, the longest mile. You know, he his shop was only like a mile and a half from my apartment. <laughs> and, and I swear it took three hours to get there. <laughs> Cause I'm driving like I'm gonna fuck up. I'm gonna fuck up. First day, I gotta sculpt a pair of human hands with these bird claws and webbing, and I've never sculpted human hands before. I've right. never even sculpted hands before. <laughs> I'm gonna fuck this up. But somehow that energy of, of being so afraid to fuck up, and then being around so many good sculptors. I met Norman Cabrera right on, on that show. You know, Norman was he was amazing even back then. Yeah, you know? yeah. And just being around that so so much of that creative force uh actually helped me to 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 do better work oh yeah 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 i i when i first came to rick's was on uh what the fuck um you know the the who uh the grinch oh grinch Grinch. yeah i came in to to replace tom gilliland because he was leaving to go start sideshow Mm -hmm. so i was just like painting who ears Two colors, you know, airbrushing. Bill Bill Sturgeon hired me. He's like, you're really overqualified for this, but you you, you know, if you want, it's a good way to get your foot in. And because I'd never worked at Rick's, and yeah. and I needed a job too. I was like really getting desperate, and uh, I was like, sure. So I went in and did that, and then uh, Apes started up, and <laughs> I got to sculpt, uh, you know, uh, a, a maquette or something, mm-hmm. and, and then I be, then I was on the sculpture crew, and. Working with you guys and uh, Mitch, you, Matt, Ka- Moto too, Kazu Moto, yeah, Kazu, Moto, yeah. It was like I, it was, it, it's like I had to, I had to rise to the occasion and get better instantly. <laughs> like just, <laughs> and it was just from being around all of you guys. I was like, because I was at Tony's for like ten years, Tony Gardner's, mm-hmm. and I was like the lead artist, so I was. You know, I wasn't getting like all the stimulation from people that were better than me. I was kind of like uh, in my own little bubble, scu- you know, doing the same t- sculpting techniques I've been doing for 10 years and not yeah. really learning from people. And I got to Rick's. And I was like, oh, shit, everybody here is better than me. And I, you know, I used to be like the, the, the best one in the shop or whatever. And 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 so I just started learning from you guys. Like I could see, you know, all these techniques you guys were doing were like 
oh, I didn't realize. Oh, I didn't realize you could do that. Oh, I didn't realize you could do that. Oh, I didn't realize you could make skin texture look that real. I just didn't know it was yeah. even possible. I remember, you know, Mitch, I was lucky. Mitch yeah, like taught, Mitch. taught me how to do, yeah. he taught me how to do skin texture, yeah. every, all of his secrets. And it was like, I didn't even know that was possible to make it look that good. Yeah, Mitch you know? is he's insane. The, the tools that he invented and the, oh yeah, yeah, the techniques. Yeah, it was mind blowing. That he, I'm like, what lemon <laughs> zester? What? Yeah, right. you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. The lemon yeah, he was zester. he was brilliant in that way. He you know he came. I still use tools that he he created. Mm -hmm. I I made a bunch of copy tools of Same his tools. Here, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. He, and he was always so. Actually, everybody was every all of that crew because it was like it was the top people. Nobody had anything to prove. Everyone was cool. Uh, everyone respected each other, and it was all like any of us would have shared any info mm -hmm. easily. There was yeah. no like, you know, the only the only thing, time you got like <clears throat> seek, people that were secretive were the guys that came in that were like not that not as good. Yeah, you know what I mean. Every once in a while, you'd see someone that was like kind of weird about stuff like that, and it always turned out they were they didn't have the goods. Yeah, like, they're just scared. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, it's kind of yeah, sad. Yeah, because I mean, because ultimately, like we're all old friends too. You know? Right. I, mean, I think right. I, I think I that's the first time I worked with you mm -hmm. directly was on Planet of the Apes. Yeah, yeah. I think you were doing so. these awesome like orangutan sculptures with these crazy textures. Right. And, that was just yeah. after I, I just learned how to. Mitch taught me how to do all the skin texture, so I was just yeah, so, I looked amazing. So I was like, oh, into it, was really good. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And but you know, but it's like it's the same thing. It's like we're all more or less old friends, right? Know? Yeah. So it's kind of like just a big sculpting party, and we've been seeing each other at Halloween parties over mm -hmm. the years, and at events yeah. and conventions, and it's like you know, it's such a small, you know, yeah, it's a very small community. Small community. It really deserves a really good uh, documentary. Or a documentary uh -huh. series, or, or just a, another big party, <laughs> <laughs> or that too. But I mean, there's so many interesting stories, and I don't know. It just seems like that was such a. It was kind of an amazing time looking back on it, you know. Especially the whole, you know, the ending of Rick's. I yeah, mean, you weren't there for the when Rick's closed, were you? Um, I I came on the the reshoot of the Wolfman. Um, oh, okay. I think I, I think Men in Black Three was the last thing he did. Right, um, right. And, and I wasn't on that, but I came back. I remember I had just finished my TV show, um, and uh, I was on vacation. I was in Catalina, and I get a call from Rick saying, hey, I'm doing a reshoot for Wolfman. I'm a little, I'm kind of freaking out. We have a lot to do in three weeks, and I need somebody to just come in and just basically run the show for me. And I said, okay, sure, I'll come in, you know, and he was, all, he was really panicked. Mm -hmm. So Monday I went in to go see him, and we sat for like an hour, mostly just shooting shit. He's telling right. me all the horror stories. <laughs> and then we, and we finally got down to the build list. And I took about like three minutes and I just said, I wrote it all down. And I said, what? This is all you have to do in three weeks? <laughs> and he's like, really? I'm like, yeah, really? I said, tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll set up morning meetings for all the departments. We'll go over everything. Well, I'll, I'll set it up so that we can just get this done. And so, so we, I started doing the morning meetings. And after the first day, he was like, oh, I don't know why I was so panicked. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, you know, this really isn't that much to do in three weeks. You know, you have a huge crew here. Right. Um, yeah, hilarious. and it was just it was just a lot of fun, you know. And, and I was really impressed with Rick because he really was, despite all the horror stories he was telling me about the Wolfman and all the bad things that happened, he's always the first guy there and the last one to leave. Right. Every night. Yeah, yep. you can tell his heart was really into that oh, project. Yeah. 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 And that that was really amazing. You know, when, when somebody you somebody that – you really respect and idolize in a business for that long still de performs like that. That's oh, yeah. Real. There's no question that Rick was definitely one of us, mm -hmm. you know, fa a fan who just really loved loved uh, his job. I mean, you look at his Instagram now. Have, yeah. do you, have you, are you seeing? Yeah, I'm really he's, happy for him. Yeah, he's yeah. just playing, and it's like an extension. It's basically he's gone for full circle and doing the stuff mm -hmm. that he used to do in his bedroom when he was a kid. That's yeah, so amazing, yeah. but with like all this amazing talent and technology, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's doing what I'm doing uh, at night after work. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been I've been sculpting in ZBrush. I've been doing doing all these '50s monsters that I love as a kid. Are you just doing them you totally know? for fun, or, or for your yeah, yeah. Uh, collectibles I'll make them thing, and or? I'll. Yeah, I'll make them and I'll sell them from at Monster Palooza to people who are like into it, like I am. You know, I just I just finished sculpting the um, uh, Invasion of the Saucer Man. Oh, cool! You know that Paul Blaisdell. Like yeah. I, I love. You know, Paul's like one of the unsung heroes of our business. Right. Like, it's like yes, his stuff was crude, but he had no money, he had no time, 
and some of his ideas were just ahead of its time, you know. Oh and yeah, right. and they're it's iconic. Like, they're iconic yeah. too. To, so I got to know. sculpt that. I did mole people, you know, oh, myself. Yeah, that was great. I managed to sell amazing. a few. Um, I just finished the creature walks among us bust, oh, cool, you know. Cool. Yeah, it's like it's a really obscure version of the yeah. creature. You know, I'll probably, <laughs> I'll probably sell one. You know, there'll be one guy that I really like it, but I, you know, I make it for myself. So if I can sell, share it with someone, great. Right. You know, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I'm going back and making it, all these man. things. Yeah, that's the way yeah. to do it. Uh, I, you know, is it is it true? Now I heard. I don't know if this is, this is true. Did you sculpt a creature from the Black Lagoon in monster clay, and mold it <laughs> in fiberglass, and the heat from the fiberglass melted, yes, your sculpture, and you had to re-sculpt the whole thing. Yes, oh <clears throat> that God. that was hands down one of the hardest things to ever had to deal with. I can't even uh, imagine because I, I know the kind of, I didn't see the, I mean, I, I didn't see the original sculpture, but I know the kind of detail you do and the qu- kind of detail it, that yeah, the creature my, re- requires. Yeah, it's on my Instagram or my professional Facebook page. Oh, okay. the, the feature creator, I think, yeah. It's, yeah, I've seen, I've seen the one that was released. It's fucking yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, Amazing. it was basically, I, I, I had done, a, done three versions of it. First one was like a, a rough out, you know, two and a half week, quickly rough it out, just some detail painted to look like clay to take it to comic-con okay <laughs> just to show that that was a work in progress That's when i came back and then i redid it <laughs> and i spent two months sculpting the second one and that was the one that because i had closed down i was doing jobs in between and at that time i didn't have the infrastructure to have somebody come in and mold it for right. me because the shop i was renting i was in between so I had, I had somebody do it for me um and i completely forgot to remind them it's monster clay sure. and they were doing it they were they you know it was a, it was a clay layup for silicone and they had a problem with the UV resin, so it wasn't kicking. So they left it in the sun for hours and hours trying to <laughs> kick it. And I didn't even think for a second, right, oh, you right. know. So then I said, well, um, we'll leave it out longer, you know. And then by the time <laughs> I realized, oh, my God, what just happened? Uh, he brought it back to me. It finally set. Uh, and we opened it up, and literally, it was just like a puddle of goo. <laughs> and I was just terrible. like, "Oh my god!" Because because I, I was doing a, another big statue project, and I was getting ready to dive into that one. Oh my and I god! Thought, Holy crap! The next two months of my life, you know, is going to be working on these statues and redoing this again. Yeah, doing something again with like yeah. super tiny yeah. scales. Yeah. And and then so I mean it was hard it was literally like I just wasted two months of my life ah, and knowing the next one's gonna take me another two months to do and so painful. I just said to myself at that point you know what turn a lemon into a lemonade yep. this there's a reason why this happened it just means that my sculpture has to be better I'm gonna make it even better did you make it and better I did wow I did. what did I, what so, did what did you do specifically. I just I resolved the detail a little tighter. I made everything a little bit more dimensional. Oh, yeah, cool! You know, I, ju- I was just, just able to crisp it up more. And just you know, right. and by the end of the day, when I was done, I was happy that I, I got a third chance to redo it. Wow, excellent! That's great. Even though it was, though it was so painful to, to start over again. Yeah, um, I heard that story because it was, was it was so <laughs> that sculpture was so much work. But I was so afraid to do it because that was my favorite monster of all time. Right. And I didn't want to be the guy to fuck it up. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it doesn't look like him. Oh God, shoot me now. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm dead. I'm dead to the world. <laughs> I can't even scope a copy of my favorite monster. You know? <laughs> well, you um, better, you better be able to after three times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh my God. So, yeah, yeah. That's a, That's just, that's, that's a story. I always, it's, it's always there in my mind because it just seems like, Ah, oh, so painful and tragic. I remember when I first worked with Monster. The first time I worked with Monster Clay was on the cave, mm-hmm. and and there was something like teeth or something, yeah, that were laying out in the mold shop in the sun. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the sun came in and it just like I came back from lunch and it was like a puddle. Yeah, and that was my first experience with. Oh, you have to be really careful with Monster Clay because it melts at a really low temperature. Really low temperature. Yeah. Yeah, you can you can melt it in microwave and pick it up, but it won't burn you. Right, right. It'll be hot, but it won't burn yeah, you. It's yeah, it's great. It's great. It's great yeah. stuff. It's great for clay pores too. Um, yeah, but uh, you gotta you gotta watch that because man, it'll, it'll. Yeah, we have a system now where we prevent that because I've 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 had about up to eleven sculptures that got, got damaged in monster clay in oh, no. the molding process. Yeah, a couple of them had to be completely resurfaced. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Just from from heat from molds? heat from the, from the fiberglass from the sun, yeah. So oh. one thing we do now is when we lay it up and we do, we do the glass as it's kicking, we use UV as it's kicking. We're spraying with cold water. Wow. Yeah, constantly just to keep the temperature cool. Wow. And then we've had we've had great luck with that. No more damages to the sculptures. That's yeah. a great idea. Interesting. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. 
it's a great clay to work with. Yeah, yeah, you it know, is. For sculpting detail, for just how it reacts to the solvents. I mean, I have yeah. a whole system down. It's super, super fast for doing that kind of stuff. But man, it's it's you gotta be careful when it goes in the mold. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Even when you're handling it, if you're holding it for a while, if you got a sculpture, it gets pretty soft. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have a bucket of cold water. Yeah. <laughs> Dip it in the water for a minute, pick, pull it back out, you're ready to go. You know, yeah. okay, the, the first time, here's the first time I ever heard about you, the Ghoul Brothers. Yes. <laughs> the Ghoul Brothers, because, here's another thing, you beat me again. That was the first time you beat me, because I put in, I like totally submitted a Ghoul Brothers thing. Oh, that's right, you did. Yeah, and it's like, yeah. I thought it, at the time, I thought it was so good, and I was like, I'm going to win it, and I sent it sent it in, and then I, I, I got the issue, and you and Matt Rose won, mm-hmm. and again, I was like... Oh, they deserved it. <laughs> it's better. <laughs> I th- I th- those were those were really really great. I mean, uh, you had like a skinny. skinny... Matt, did the, Matt did the skinny one. Okay, and you did the fat I did guy. The fat one. Yeah. yeah. The, the idea was I came up with the idea of uh, great, doing man. a Gene Siskel Roger Ebert. Oh, okay. The school <laughs> brothers, yeah. And so we sculpted that uh, in the, in the winter winter time, and the clay was hard as a rock, and uh, but we finished it, and then we didn't hear anything about it. Uh, at all it wasn't until a friend called us and said hey you guys won i'm like what and we had oh, to go really? to the store buy the issue just to find out yeah. that we won yeah. for people who don't know that was a fangoria contest and god what year was this it must have been uh, 85 yeah january 85 is things when it came okay out. okay yeah. wow yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and then so for the longest time we were known when we came to la to, to meet with people People already had seen Fangoria, so they they called Matt and I the Ghoul Brothers. <laughs> so for the first couple of years of our career, we were known as the Ghoul Brothers. Oh my god, that's hilarious! <laughs> yeah, so how did you how did you meet Matt? Uh, I met Matt through a mutual friend. It was actually, um, you know, Johnny Psycho, right? Oh he, yeah, yeah. Who, best, I've known the, him the best name in makeup effects. Yeah, I, I've known him <laughs> since I was twelve years old. Oh, so no he, way. he was yeah he was actually quite instrumental in my education about. You know, sci-fi conventions and costume contests. And, this is and where? where, where? This is back in San Jose, California. Oh, okay, like San Jose. Up north, yeah. And, you know, so I met him when I was 12, and I didn't start making the stuff till I was about 14. But he was my brother's, my older brother's friend. They do martial arts together and whatnot. But then when my mom one day uh, was really worried about me because I was in my room 18 hours a day sculpting. Wow. And I came out, <laughs> I came out only to eat and to check mail because I, was, I ordered all these <laughs> mask catalogs. You know, I was buying masks and stuff. <laughs> So she got really worried about me, and she asked Johnny, hey, Johnny, you go to discos and you meet girls. Can you get Steve to go out there to discos and meet girls? <laughs> so he came in, and he, he was going to, like, straighten me up. And then he sees all the stuff in my room, all these masks. And he's like, wow, did you make this? And I was like, yeah. He's like, have you heard of conventions and costume contests? And next time my mom saw it, he was in the garage <laughs> helping me build my first full monster suit. That's hilarious. <laughs> and a little Yoda. Uh, a wow. costume of Yoda for his little brother to wear. Wow! Both, both of which have won grand prize and first prize at the, the convention <laughs> of costume, you know, in San Jose. That's what you get when you sculpt eighteen hours a day when you're a kid, I guess. Yeah, and then so we we just became friends, and then eventually when I moved to LA, he came down a year after I did. So then, he he so you got him into effects basically. Yeah, yeah well, he came down to be an actor. He, also, he writes music and, and he's the musician. Right. He's, he's been in, in and out of bands. Right. But ultimately, the, the backup for him was, you know, he also loved monsters. So he ended up, beca- I, I got him a job at um, at Rick's on Gremlins 2. Mm. I told Jim Rillander, like, hey, he's a good friend of mine. He doesn't know much, but he's been around it. You know, would you be interested in hiring him? He interviewed with Jim. Jim liked him. Cool. Brought him in. And that's kind of the start of his career. You know, he's still in the business doing stuff. Yeah, right. <clears throat> yeah. And yeah. Uh, so that's all the, how that happened. Um, and then you met Matt through him? Right, and then so one day Johnny called me up. This was uh, '83. He says, "Hey, I was I was at this convention, and I and I met this guy named Ralph Miller from L.A. Oh yeah, just, I remember Ralph just, Miller. <laughs> yeah, he just moved up north, trying to get to ILM, and he was walking around with this big mechanical werewolf head. And apparently, he, he met Ralph, and Ralph says, "Hey, you know, I'm having a meeting. I'm trying to meet all the local artists here. Um, show up, you know." So I showed up with Johnny, and then there was Ralph, and then there's a guy named Mitch Gonzalez, who I'm still friends with. And then on the other side was this skinny dude that looks like Charles Manson with a red bandana on his head, uh, which was Matt <laughs> and his friend Don Allen, who I'm still friends with. We just had dinner the other night. Wow. And and so, you know, this was 83. And so I'm seeing like a table full of these fantastic masks. 
Um, and so I asked Ralph, wow, how did, wh- how did you sculpt this kind of detail? And Ralph just says, oh, well, you should ask the sculptor. And it was Matt. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I asked Matt and Matt, like, you know, he, he's, I'm like, you know, he looked like he was a hardcore acid rock kind of guy. Right. Like, <laughs> metal. And so I said to him, like, you know, I'm like, hey, dude, like, you know, um, who are you into? Like Ozzy, you know, Iron Maiden. And he's like, Bach, Vivaldi, <laughs> Beethoven. I'm like, oh, OK. And so we, we literally said like 10 words to each other. And then uh, and we exchanged numbers and whatever. And that was the end of that. And then a year later, I get a call from him out of nowhere. And he says, hey, it's, it's Matt. I met you a year ago. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, he says, uh, I got contacted by the guy who wants the wizard makeup. Would you be interested in the wizard makeup? And I said, no. <laughs> but but I said, are you still making masks? And he says, yeah, I'm making a bunch to sell at Larry's Theatrical. And Larry's is a local costume shop that I used to go and buy stuff from all the time. Mm-hmm. So and so I uh, so I said, can I come by and check it out? So I drove up to his house, which was like 30 minutes away from my house. And he had these fucking amazing masks that he sculpted, hand painted, and he would like brush out crepe hair and, and boil them. And so he was doing handlate. he was doing great work even back then. Oh, he was amazing. Matt Matt was like a good five years ahead of me. Wow. In terms of sculpt, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I learned I learned a lot just watching him work. He was right. he was already way way more advanced than I was. Um, and then so we so then he and I decided to get together and start our own mask company. Uh, which we call Bizarre Creations, and we made all these masks. So the funny story about about one of the stories that was funny was that you know Matt was always very introverted, like, yeah. you know, and he couldn't deal with like people, especially bullies and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so we made all these masks, and we went to Larry's to to sell it. And as we're driving there, he says, "Oh, I hate this part." I said, "What's up?" He goes, "I hate Larry. He's a fucking businessman, and he always tries to bully me and all this kind of shit." And I and I know Larry, you know Larry, yeah, he's he's kind of like that. So I said, oh, that's interesting. So we go in there, and I'm like, I said, Matt, just let me do all the talking. <clears throat> and we're, we're 18 years old, right? <laughs> and then so we lay out all these masks, you know, like 20 masks. And they look great, I thought, you know. And so Larry comes down. He's like, hello, boys. He goes, wow, wow, these are fantastic masks. He goes, so how much? And right before Matt was able to speak, he goes, careful now. <laughs> and I could, just see, I could just see Matt like, oh, like he was like froze. He was so pissed, you know, but he didn't know what to say. And, right. and for some reason, right at that moment, I had an idea. And like our most expensive mask was like sixty five dollars, uh-huh. you know, or on six sixty bucks. So I just said, so I just said, well, Larry, you know, I said, I, I've been coming here for years buying masks from you. And you've always been so kind to let me go out to the warehouse and. I was said, I'm going to cut you a great deal today. I said, these masks here, they're seventy five bucks. But I'm gonna give it to you for sixty five. <laughs> you know? Excellent. And these are and, and I upped the price and I gave him a discount and he's like, "That's awesome. That's great. I'll take them all." Amazing. So we stole all the masks, <laughs> gave us a check, and we walked out. And Matt was like, "That was awesome." <laughs> <laughs> he got Larry back, you know. Oh, that's so cool. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. He really, yeah. Uh, yeah. You you saved him. You saved the yeah. day. Yeah. That's amazing. So did you guys come down to L.A. together? Um. We technically no. Okay. What was going on was um, uh, I was we we came down to L.A. There's another roommate, Mark Williams, that came down with us, mm-hmm. and we came down in March of '85 on a weekend to see if we can see some shops. Of course, weekends are the worst time. Right. So we already met Bob Burns. So we met with Bob. He took us to LAFX, and we met um, uh, uh, Bob and Dennis Skotek, the mm-hmm. Alien, on the Academy Award. Mm-hmm. So we got to see a lot of their stuff, and they were really awesome. Uh, we had talked to, we had met up with Steve Laporte. He was mm. kind, of, kind enough to see us on a weekend. So we went to his house and, you know, talked to him, showed him our work. And then we met a couple other people, but none of the big, like, Stan Winston's or Rick's or whatever, because everybody was gone for the weekend. Right. But after that, we were kind of like, oh, we got we to gotta move down. So we had set a time to move down. Uh, for me, it was going to be August, because I was working a day job at a computer factory, mm. uh, repairing computer disk hard drives. And not knowing what a fuck a computer was, <laughs> <laughs> but I was repairing the hard drives. Wow! <laughs> and then, um, and then, uh, and then Matt and Mark got a call by LAFX by Bob and Dennis Gotek to go to LA to uh, resculpt the derelict ship for Aliens. Wow! The scene got cut out, I guess, but right. they they shot it. So Matt and Mark went down. Uh, I think like April or May or something, and they went down. And they resculpted this entire ship for the film. And they ended up working on another low-budget film with Fred Olin Ray. 
And during that time, I was commissioned to build a monster suit for Japanese museum. So I was working a day job at the computer place, and then at nighttime, afternoon, I would drive up to Matt's house because we had a little shop in his backyard, mm. and I would build this monster suit by myself. Um, and then I finished that basically uh, like in mid-August, and then once I was done, I packed it up and I moved down end of August. And uh, and Matt and Mark was holding the apartment oh, for wow. me because they had a three bedroom apartment, and I was paying for one one bedroom until I was able to move down. So I had a place to go. Um, and then the first week that I was down there, I was going to look around L.A. And then Matt says – Matt was working for Stan Winston on Invaders from Mars. Oh, wow. And he says, hey, Alec, this guy named Alec Gillis, he runs the show with uh, Rick Lazzarini, and they're looking for an extra person to come work. So I went into interview with them, and then I started work the next day, and that's how I got started down there. Wow. And what what, you, what were you working on? Uh, Invaders from Mars. Oh, so you were working – oh, okay. I didn't realize yeah, it was is. a lot of running polyfoam, seeming. Right. Uh, and then near the end, I got to do a lot of painting. Oh, okay. uh, then I finally met Stan near the end of the show. And it was kind of cool because I was, Stan saw what I was painting. He really liked what I was doing. So he asked me to do, paint some other stuff, and, and that was cool. And then I went on set, and I learned how to work on set from Stan. Wow. Stan, was, Stan was amazing. He had an amazing system really? of, of how to interact with ADs and how to be prepared. Hmm. And I learned all that being on set and so that when I went off on my own – and work with ADs and stuff. I've never had any problems with them. They always come up to me and go, "Man, you're like the most professional, prepared person I ever oh, wow. worked with," because I, you know, I learned from Stan like how to always be prepared. Right. And always ask them. Don't wait for them to come to you. Ask them what's going on. What's what's right. next? When do you when do you foresee? So you prepared. So as soon as they call you, you're right there. You right. Know? Right. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. I didn't realize that. Well, I got to ask you before we end this. You have to talk a little bit. I know people are gonna be pissed if you don't talk about Predator. You oh, have to. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know you're probably sick of talking about that, but I know people are going to be bummed out if I don't at least ask you a little bit about. What do you how, want to know? <laughs> well, how did you get? How did that come to be? I mean, that was you and Matt, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell. I'll tell you the the funner aspect of it because okay. that show that show was kind of a nightmare. But was it? Yeah, uh, it was. Um, we had eight weeks to do everything, start to wow. finish, <laughs> and it was it was during Christmas break, so everybody was gone. Wow, and Matt and it was my Matt and I did you know Matt was going to do the head, and so I was in charge of everything else. Uh, I got to design it with Stan. You know, Stan was working on the head. I did the body, all mm-hmm. the armor, weapons, paint job, everything. And um, but the way that came about was Matt and I was doing Monster Squad. Oh for right, Stan. right, yeah. Right. And then so uh, we 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 were given the opportunity to do the Gill Man, which was like I want to do the Gill Man, you know. So it's great. That was <laughs> that was amazing until I found out why we got it. Oh, well. nobody else. Nobody else wanted to do it because because at, at the end when we you know, when Stan says okay, so Matt and Steve will do the Gill Man. I was like yes, and then when he left, I was asking everybody, so how do we make a monster suit? And no one knew. Oh really? <laughs> and I was like, oh, let the newbie tank. You know, <laughs> oh, I get no. it. That's so, why you're like. That's why you ended up being like one of the best suit guys in the business, I guess, right? Yeah, because <laughs> Matt and I had to come up with how to do the seamless suit. Wow. We, Testing the, the whole gluing idea, the overlapping and all the stuff. I mean, that was all tested on the fly. Wow. We, we, we didn't know that it was all going to be 100% seamless until the night that he worked. And, uh, you know, and I have photos from that session, uh, you know, with Stan there in the trailer and we're putting Tom Woodruff in. And I remember putting the boots on and then gluing it. And then Matt and I were like, okay, it works. <laughs> you know, this is, we can't see the seam. All right, now let's do the hands. And we put the hands on, we glued it. It was like, Oh my God, it's working! And then it had this <laughs> giant mask with this giant flipping seam on it. I'm like, all right, now for the real test. We put the mask on, and we glued it, and the seam was gone. And I was just like, and we were sweating, like we didn't know it was going to work or wow. not. And I just remember Dave Killen was there watching the whole thing, and Dave just came up, and just says, "Wow, this is like a religious experience," because he never seen anything like it before. Right. We didn't know it was going to work, and Stan was so happy. He got so many compliments that night, you know. About, you know, the guys from Local 40 were saying, I've been in this business 30 years, you know, never seen anything like this before, you wow. know. And so Stan was just an ear to ear, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so after that, um, one day I, I was at I was at the shop just by myself and and the and his secretary was there. And I had to prepare a, a chest wound thing for the gill man because I had to blow his chest out. So I was there making the appliance for it and whatever. It was two people in the shop. So I go, you know, I, I can trim this in the office front part and just, you know keep the secretary company we just have a conversation mm. so as i'm doing this stan comes in and stan's like what are you dying i'm like um <laughs> I'm, I'm making this for tonight to go on set you know i go no 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 you're you're goofing around talking to a girl i'm like 
no, I'm working too. He goes, I see. And he goes into his office, which is right next to me. And then like, I'm talking and I'm working. And then 20 minutes later, he comes back out. Still talking, huh? <laughs> like, well, Stan, it's all, I'm, I'm just about done with this thing, you know? Uh-huh. And then he's like, okay, get in my office. And I thought, oh, fuck, I'm fired. <laughs> <laughs> so he sits me down. He says, close that door. And he says, I'm really pissed at you right now. And I, and I was, I'm like literally shaking in my boots, like cold sweat <laughs> and shit. You know, I'm, I'm like 20 years old. And he's, uh, and he's just like, you know, I'm so upset at you right now that I'm doing a show called Predator, and I want you to help me design it and build it. Wow. I put, I put you in charge. And he gave, me, he gave me a second raise. Wow. And I was like, and then after I cleaned the pee out of my pants. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I got the job. But apparently what, one thing that had happened uh, when I wasn't there, I heard this from Shannon Shea, was that one of the nights, I, one of the days I came in like 15 minutes late or something, in the morning Stan had pulled the Gilman suit that we had finished into the middle of the shop and made everybody stand around it. And he made a declaration like, this is one of the best things to ever come out of the shop. Wow. You know, best suits come out of the shop. And he was made by a couple of 20 year olds. Holy shit. And that pissed <laughs> off a lot of people. I bet, who, man. Yeah. And so there was a mark on my back at that point, you know, and I didn't even know. I, was, I wasn't even a part of it. Wow. Uh, yeah. And then, and then so when Stan gave me Predator, it just made things worse. So, oh, I bet, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if I should go into how nightmarish it was, but it was basically, for the, we had two months. <laughs> First month was myself, Matt, and Shannon Shea. And Shannon was the administrator. He was supposed to be in charge of scheduling, whatever. Mm-hmm. So I, do, I did a lot of the artwork, and then Matt was doing the head. And we were working like 72 hours at a time. Oh, my God. Right? Just not sleeping and, and hallucinating and whatever. Wow. Last month, I said to Stan, Stan, we're in trouble. There's no way three of us can make this show. We need more people. And we ended up getting this huge crew to come in last month just to get it finished enough that I can take it down to Mexico and finish it down there, you know, a few days before shooting. And so that's how it, it got done. Oh, my God. And there's a bunch of crazy stories that happened that I could have been fired for and I didn't. And, <laughs> you know, like like when I was sculpting the body, Stan came in and goes, no, no, he's way too skinny. He needs to be big like arnold schwarzenegger big and i said no he shouldn't be big he's flying climbing all over trees he should have a big dancer's body muscular but right. the life that you know and he's like no no he needs to be big just change it and he he leaves and he comes back the next day i'm already detailing i didn't change a thing and i'm just looking back like he's gonna fire me and he looks at it he goes that looks good and he walks away <laughs> I'm <just> like, okay <laughs> and then and one of the other times was i finished painting the suit Right. Stan was very kind. He was always very kind to me, mm. I have to say. You know, he, he was really only the, the only real mentor I ever had. Mm. And and uh, when I designed the paint job for the Predator, I showed him this the, the paint job. And he just says, I don't need to see it. He says, you've already exceeded my expectations. That's amazing. And anything you do is going to continue to exceed my expectations. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just and I'm what thinking myself. confidence. Yeah, and I'm thinking to myself, no, no, I'm a fraud. I need you, I need you to 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 approve this. Right. You know? But he didn't. He didn't want to even want to look at it. That's amazing. So I just painted this thing, um, and then he came in and he loved it. He was like, "This is amazing. I love it." You know. And then I said, "Well, it's not done yet. You see, I'm gonna put this mesh all over the body." And he's like, uh, "What? What? 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 What mesh?" I said, you know, the mesh in the drawings that I did, you know, it, 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 and I said, it gives him a sense of intelligence. He's technological, you know, he's a warrior, but a hunter. Mm-hmm. And this is all, this all helps him in his, you know, makes him look like an intelligent creature. And he's like, no, don't cover up the paint job. No mesh, no mesh. And he leaves. And next day he comes back and the mesh was already halfway glued on with crazy glue. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's like, uh, and I'm thinking I'm fired. And he's like, looks great. And he leaves. <laughs> wow. Right and right and then, but here's the here here is the brilliance of Stan Winston. I have okay. to say this. This is what makes the man brilliant. He came back with the producer uh, a couple of days later, and the suits were like practically done. Right, he's got the mesh all over it. And Joel Silver comes in and stands to show him all the stuff, and he says, "And I look at this body. Look at the mesh. You see how it makes him an intelligent creature. <laughs> you see how and basically everything I said to him, he pitched it to Joel, and he sold it. Yeah, you know." <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 how you do it, man. You got to yeah. sell the ideas. Yeah, no. One thing I really appreciated about Stan was that Stan, he had a good eye for mm-hmm. people that had talent. It's not without motives, you know. Obviously, you want to bring somebody into your studio that can 
make your studio look good. Right. So over the years, he's always brought people in that could do great work for his studio, but then thus giving these artists an opportunity right, right. to shine, you know, yeah, and yeah. to build a portfolio. He did that way before I was there. He did it way after I was there. You know, right. there's so many great artists like Joey Orozco, oh, like yeah. all these guys that came out. I remember on, on Gremlins too, Joey wasn't even allowed to sculpt. Or Jose Fernandez. They weren't even allowed to sculpt on Gremlins 2. What, why? And, because they just weren't experienced enough, I guess, or something. They were hired to do something else, like oh, painting weird. and whatever. Yeah. Jose Fernandez, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right? Fucking, Jose's fucking amazing. Yeah, like, right. Joey, they're fucking masters amazing. of what they do. Yeah, yeah so, so that's what I'm saying. It's like eventually, like, all these people, they got their chance to shine and to show what they're, what they're really about. And then they became, you know, really, like, you know, fixtures in, in our business. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's incredible. That's I, I never worked at Stans. That's one of the shops I never worked at Steve Johnson's, and I never worked at Stans, mm-hmm. and I never worked at Canums. <laughs> yeah, I, I worked at Canums. You um, worked at like every shop, pretty much, didn't you? I didn't work at Steve's. I worked. Oh, you didn't. I worked, I worked for Steve at Boss Films when he was running the Creature Shop. Oh, right. So I, I did work. I did get to work with Steve. Right. Uh, on that, but not when he had his own studio. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I I had a great time working with Steve Johnson. He's an, another one of these guys that. You know, he really had a good eye yeah, for, seeing, for sure. seeing talent and seeing stuff. And he was really kind to me. He gave me so many opportunities to do stuff. I always loved the boss. work that came out of his shop. Yeah, and stuff this that stuff he was did. brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's, it was really good. Yeah, it was just amazing stuff. There's always there's always some sort of innovation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What about uh, Rob's? You ever worked for Rob? No, I never. That was one worked. shop I always wanted to work at. I don't know if you want to. I know. I've heard. I've heard. <laughs> just get the story that I heard. I met Rob once uh. Uh, at some function. And I saw him, and I was like, "Holy shit, it's Rob Bottin!" And he comes in, and he's like a giant. Yeah. He's like six four or six five, or maybe taller. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and he came up to me, and he says, "You're Steve Wang. I know you." And I was blown away that somebody like right. him would even know my work. You know, and this was way early in my career. Wow. So that was kind of cool. But but just to show you, tell you why you probably don't want to work for Rob, is Moto worked at uh, Rob for like four years. Oh, that's right. <laughs> and he says that I heard stories about Rob. He breaks people. Yeah. He says, I'm not going to let him break me. And I will do, I will, no matter how hard he is, I'm not going to let him break me. <laughs> four years later, he told me some horror stories. Really? Not, not about Rob being mean or an asshole, just about how they'll spend all this time and Rob expect him to work 18, 20 hours oh, yeah. straight to do something and next morning come in, change his mind and start oh, over again. Oh, yeah. I've heard, yeah, I heard that. The next day, yeah. I heard that. that, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I heard that they would, I heard that Rob's, Rob paid well and he yeah. paid overtime, but he made you work these crazy hours and you could, they could have like a whole suit done and then people would come in the next day and the whole thing would be like Rob had been there all night tearing it down and sculpting mm-hmm. something new. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Moto told me all these stories, you know, right. and he did it for four years and I said, well, how was it? And he says, he broke me. Oh, really? Moto? <laughs> if, if he, he broke he, Moto, then... <laughs> <laughs> he said he broke me, and I said, "I said, Moto, you had to be smart enough to know this was a no-win situation <laughs> because you are the person that have to implement. You're not the dealer, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're never going to win this fight." And he's That's like, amazing. Yeah. He, said he was so determined to prove that he was not going to get broken by Rob. And yeah, well, got, yeah. Just, if 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 so. Moto couldn't do it, then uh, you know, if Moto, mm-hmm. if he broke Moto, he'd break anybody because Moto was like, yeah, Moto's Mister Patient. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and also very. <laughs> tough and 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 you know yeah a very strong person yeah well man i mean this has been a really excellent conversation we're getting up to two hours i don't want to keep you too long but uh, I, I would yeah <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> uh, yeah i mean I, I hopefully you'll come back again sometime because absolutely anytime man. way more stuff i want to talk to you about because your career uh, like i said it's it goes without saying you've worked on pretty much every cool monster movie that's ever been made in the last 30 40 years what was 30 years i mean how long five years it's amazing right yeah it's It's crazy yeah yeah yeah. so i i definitely want to have you on again if that's cool if you're Uh, absolutely if you say if you say it on here i'm gonna hold you to it you hold me to it i'm (laughs) I'm, I'm down excellent excellent yeah it's it's a great time it's it's like just us we must just be at a bar and have a drink that's basically (laughs) <laughs> it's just so much fun. I mean, I just yeah. I love hearing about all these stories, man. And, and uh, yeah, I just said 
such a great time. So thanks so much for coming on, man. I really yeah, appreciate pleasure. it. It's super fun. People are going to dig this. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening to the podcast. Um, if you want to join the Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash Dark Art Society, and you get the podcast a day early, and you get some other little benefits for that as well, and you support the podcast. And that's it. So thank you, Steve, once again. Really My appreciate pleasure. it. Yeah, let's, say good, let's say goodbye to everybody. All right. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. I hope we didn't bore anybody. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think I love it. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>